And welcome back again to another episode of your favorite true crime and criminal culture podcast. Thought Riot Podcast. My name's Brendan. And I am Malia. Welcome to the show. Happy to see you. Happy, happy to be here. Happy, happy. Woo. No, but really, we're super happy that you're here with us, and we have an awesome show set up for you, because it is your favorite true crime and criminal culture podcast. You know, someone said that to me. They were like, it's super funny how you guys call yourselves, like, your favorite, assuming that we're everyone's favorite show. Duh. Yeah, of course. That's what we're called. We are called the favorite, your favorite. We're just indoctrinating you. Yes, that's it. Exactly. I was waiting for you to pick up on it. All right. So let's get into it. So we commit to the Thought Riot podcast axiom for being honest, intelligent, unscripted. And interesting conversations, bringing information we get, following it to wherever it leads, holding nothing back, and sharing brutal honesty the entire time. Because we censor nothing. And talk about everything. Bam. That's it. All right. So, tonight, uh, it has been a crazy week for me. I hope that it hasn't been a crazy week for you. And uh, we're going to try and shorten this one down i swear every time i say that we're gonna shorten one down and like keep it you know to a reasonable time that's normally when you get like a five hour show but uh because of that we didn't pick a uh a spotlight this week everything feels last minute uh i got back into the area last minute everything was delayed and everything was just way longer than it should have took so we're gonna try and get through it we're gonna dive right into the topic so make sure that you check us out on all the social media platforms literally everything everything except for one on everything you can find us at forward slash thought riot podcast spelled all the way out thought riot podcast except for twitter Twitter, we are forward slash thought riot pod. I feel like Twitter needs to fix that. Like, I know all of them can be thought riot podcast except for Twitter. Yeah, it's lame. Got to stand out, I guess. But, uh, anyways, make sure you add us on Twitter. It is forward slash thought riot pod. I feel like Twitter's taking a little bit longer to get like going because of that i assume it's because of that i don't know maybe it's something else but anyways make sure you check us out on everything we are on every single podcast platform there is out there all of them in the u.s all of them in the world wide um so whatever your favorite podcast platform is make sure you hop on there and check us out hit that reminder for when new videos come out, leave us a comment, let us know how we're doing, leave us some ratings, and let us know that you watched the episode. Um, and if you do that, we appreciate you. You are a thought rioter. And uh, yeah, so what are your episodes tonight my cases yes your cases topics, your cases your cases yes cases slash topics um so tonight i'm going to be going over the most recent brian koberger court hearing where they discussed their appeal the to the supreme court and also the motion to reconsider the judge's decision um on rejecting you know their motion to overturn the indictment the grand jury indictment um which that that hearing was just on friday the 26th of january 2024 um just in case you're listening to this at a different date um but and oh and the scheduling order because the state wants brian koberger's trial scheduled for this summer of 2024 um so I'm going to go over that and what was said and dropped some bombshell statements. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
and I found a few things fairly interesting um, and questionable. So we'll go over that. And also, I would like to touch on the interview that Steve Gonzalez and Christy Gonzalez, which is Kaylee Gonzalez, um, one of the four victims in the Idaho Four murders, uh, their parent, her parents did an interview on Good Morning America, and it was very short. Like, we didn't get to see the whole actual interview. I tried looking to see if they were going to put that somewhere, but they didn't. Um, they only gave us, like, a short snippet, and they talk more about how her body was found and yes. the upcoming hearing. But it's, like, it's really short. But it's it's something we didn't know before in her positioning that supposedly came from coroner Ka- Kathy Mabba in... I was like, whoa, what can that tell us? Yeah, um, it's interesting. And then, because on a recent live stream, um, we were, I don't honestly remember exactly how it got brought up, but we were discussing how time of death is determined. Um, and I didn't go too far into it, but I, I wanted to look more into it to understand it a bit better and while I still only have a pretty surface level understanding, um, it is interesting. And I have questions when it relates to the Ida four killings of how they determine the cause of death. And if they looked at some of the things that I found out they can do, if they looked at them. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the big question in a lot of this is that we have so many great minds looking into this case and every case that we cover that, you know, we're eat, we each have our own specialty and way of looking of th- at things out there. And that's why I say all the time that, you know, it's, it's not us who are the smart ones. It's this community. It's you guys, you know, and it, it's one, it's a way to have a hundred minds, a thousand minds, a hundred thousand minds, uh, all working together to problem solve. And that's actually one thing I'm going to be able to, to touch on tonight. So, uh, did you go over all three years? Okay. Okay. Uh, so I just have a shout out is what I was looking for. And I have kept forgetting and kept forgetting and kept forgetting. And, um, you know, one of the levels of, uh, our membership is once you hit that third tier or higher, you get shout outs. And we've had a couple come up on YouTube And one thing that I need to do is if you're one of those listeners, I'm assuming you're an avid Thought Riot podcaster, um, then if you join one of those levels, let me know it's okay to shout out your name uh, on here because it does show me names on my side. Um, Well, the name that you put in your account, not anything that, you know, you you don't want happening. Uh, But the... Each episode gets a couple hundred thousand views an episode, so I just don't know if people want me shouting their name out there. So I'm just going to say we appreciate JK. Uh, If that's you, you are incredible, and you are the newest third-tier Thought Rider major. Uh, And uh, if it's okay to give you a shout out and put you in on, um, you know, our scrolling bar that you see right here uh, or talk about you on here, um, reach out to me. Give us a heads up, even a comment or an email at our email um, and let me know that it's okay because I want to show appreciation. I just don't want to put someone out there that doesn't want to be, you know what I mean? But shout out to you. We appreciate you. And then uh, my three cases that we're going to be getting into today. um, The first one is going to be talking about the three newest search warrants that have come out. Uh, They are backdated and they were just unsealed. So they're a little bit dated, but I think they still need to be talked about, especially since tech is my thing, you guys, if you guys haven't figured that out, like I pretty much understand anything that could possibly be talked about if it's tech related, uh, unless it's some kind of operating system or program or software that's like brand new and just created. And I might know, not know the name of that, but 
a lot of people have a lot of confusion around these search warrants, and I think it would be really helpful for us to dig into that and look at what some of those things mean. Uh, and some of it's pretty interesting. So we're going to be talking about those. Um, we are going back into this was completely unplanned until today today i decided to change it and i decided to change it in response to all the comments we we're getting you just covered the peeping tom topic where we are looking into some of the the serial killer behavioral traits some really important red flags when you see um when when you've seen serial killers who have been caught and looking at them in a way that could Brian Koberger have some of these uh, red flags from his past? Now, we didn't talk about one of the things, or if we did, we lightly grazed over it. And the amount, the gross amount of comments that uh, we've gotten about this situation, I had to bring it back up. I had to talk about it again. It might end up being a short case video, but that's okay. I definitely think it needs to be talked about especially from a perspective of somebody that understands the technology behind it. Um, so just stay tuned. We will dig into that. And then we have one of the famous cases that have never been solved. It doesn't feel like police even have a direction, honestly, is the Dorothy Scott case. Have you heard of that? No. No, where uh, her body was found with dead animal bones on top or next to it, or mixed into it, or... No? Mm -hmm. Oof, it is a wild one. I gotta tell you guys, it is very strange, very spooky-ish, uh, and uh, stay tuned. So, we will get right into it. Those are my three. Now we're digging into the breaking news of the week by Thought Riot Podcast, and I will kick it off here with... Probably the interesting one. Um, so, John Walsh. You know who John Walsh is? No. If I, after I describe what he was, you will know who I'm talking okay, about. Okay, okay. Uh, America's Most Wanted Host. No. What? The, the peppered hair, America's Most Wanted, was slick back? Dude, America's Most Wanted. Anyways, okay. Okay, yeah. Okay, I know who it is. Got it. So, a <laughs> little bit of background. For any, any of you younger people watching, you know we got a major spike in a younger demographic watching Yay! us, which is awesome. That's incredible, you know. Uh, but uh, for anybody that's younger, John Walsh was the host, is the host uh, of America's Most Wanted. Okay, and it was a semi spooky. Tr it, it's probably is one of the shows that started all the interest into true crime and true crime content creators like hmm. absolutely incredible. Why did it start? It started because his son was abducted like 40 years ago. Yeah. And weeks. Okay. I'm not focusing on him. I'm, I'm going to be focusing on his comments, but his story is important to this. So weeks after his son went missing, his son went missing in a department store. Just they were there together and then he was gone, dude. Um, and I think he was six. I probably should have triple checked that. Um, but he was young. Uh, weeks later, they found, um, unfortunately this is super sad. Um, Weeks later, they found his head 120 miles from their house where he was abducted from. So clearly he didn't uh, live. And, um, you know, I can't imagine being a parent going through something like that. But what him and his wife ended up doing is... Um, is starting programs and systems to help find kids and criminals. And it, it slowly turned into essentially America's most wanted. And he ended up hosting the show. Um, and what's insane is through all the years, essentially a decade of this show. Okay. They caught a hundred or a 1200, 1200 criminals because of this show specifically because of this show they caught 17 
of the FBI's top 10 most wanted. That is the, the, there is not a single FBI agent, singular FBI agent out there that has ever had these kinds of stats, not even half of them, not even close. So, uh, the public did that the true crime community, the online and public sleuths did that. That was all public and him presenting the stories. That is so incredible. It is incredible. But, um, you know, it, it it's nice to know that he kept fighting the good fight, but it, nothing like that's going to fill the loss that he had, you know, from, from losing his kid. So where I'm going with this. He was on an interview and he specifically talked about the Idaho 4 case and he reached out, you know, ver not reached out to the parents to connect with them, but made a statement for them to hear. And, uh, you know, he was just saying that the only thing that they need to focus on and that they can do is just worry about getting through the trial because they are victims. They are victims like he was a victim. Uh, he said, just yeah. trust in the justice system. And regardless of the outcome, he believes that they will find justice. It, it is so vague. He wasn't suggesting that Koberger could be innocent. He wasn't suggesting Koberger could be guilty. He was suggesting trust the process. You know, you guys have a suspect or it is a newer investigation. So just trust the process. Don't get caught up in all the, the noise that's going on. Um, and, uh, you know, he said that they just have to show up at the trial or be connected to it and pay attention so that they're aware of if this next day they're going to show something, something that you will never be able to unsee, uh, you know, be conscious of that and maybe don't be in there that day or, uh, you know, make sure you step out before that evidence gets shown, something like that. Um, but it it was really interesting to see him, of all people, reach out to them in that way. And, you know, before this happened, I didn't realize that he did this because of his son. I knew he was a, attached to a crime or something in some way, a victim of a crime. I didn't realize that he had his son abducted from him and created this show to help, you know, bring people to justice. What, what an incredible dude. Yeah, it is incredible um, that he did all of this. And I mean, that f dude, 71 people. 17. Oh, of 17. the FBI's top 10 most wanted. The single oh, okay, most, okay. more than any other <laughs> that was so dyslexic. FBI, FBI agent out there. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible, regardless. Because most wanted FBI is... top 10. That's yeah. like, dude, that is serious crime solving here. That's the that's FBI top 10. Think of how many uh, suspects there are at any given time in the U.S. And they caught 17 of the top 10. Just from calling in, from the public, staying aware, giving information, digging, and helping solve these cases that he talked about on TV. Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. It sounds like the reason he reached out was trying to give them some peace and serenity, you know, because out of all the families, the most public are the Gonzalez family. And they seem to be struggling um, with the process of all of this. Uh, it, yeah. And they're publicly struggling. Like every interview they do, they have concerns. Um, yeah. So he's, he's probably just thinking about it from, you know, like a well-being perspective for I agree. them. I think it was and, very nice. Yeah. Trying to do something nice for, for them. Look, and... If any of the victims' families ever watched our show, one, I hope they understand the angle that we come from here, that regardless what we talk about, we're going to talk about it in a very respectful way because, yes, I 100% agree they're victims and I can't imagine what they're going through. Um, so it, one thing that he has that all of us content created, well, I can't say everybody, but it, most of the people that I know of uh, don't have is he can relate to them 
because he lost a kid. I, yeah. I think losing a kid is something that you can't pretend to imagine unless it happens to you. That puts you in a class or a group of people all on its own. You know what I mean? And yep. for him to go out of his way to make a comment to him and a suggestion as they're going through pre-trial and going to be ramping up to the trial, which is going to get way more attention. I thought it was super nice. And it really made me think that he's such a, he's such a good guy to have something so horrible happen and be like, you know, this is out of my control, but I'm not going to lay over and just let the world have its way with me. I'm going to try and prevent this happening from other people. To yeah. other people, you know what I mean? Which I thought was incredible. And I'm curious what you guys think about it. Um, you know, it made me look at him in a whole new light. And uh, I, I hope that the victim's families really get something from that. Yeah, I hope so, too. Um, is his show still running? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. You know, th with these breaking news stories, they aren't case stories. So I don't dig into people's backgrounds. I don't dig into every detail. I We essentially take politics out of the, the uh, mainstream media and just briefly talk about them, you know, of what's yeah. going on. So I, I, I think so. Yeah, it, it appears to be. Now well, I want I want to watch a show now. Yeah, because <laughs> I don't know I don't know how much I've actually seen of it. I'm not oh, sure. Oh gosh, the intro little jingle song. Yeah, I it used to scare me when I was like really young. It's been out forever, dude. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's an awesome show though. It's it's good, especially I when I've always watched it. I never knew those metrics of success. You know. Um, and 1,200 of the nation's uncatchable criminals, 17 of the FBI's top 10 most wanted. Like that, that's insane, dude. And that is directly the public. That is us people who have an interest. It is you people who have an interest. It is, you know, the public. I mean, that's a really amazing thing to highlight considering how much flack we all get. You know, the whole true crime community, if you're a creator or somebody who does a lot of digging and cares about these cases and wants to talk about it, um, and you don't agree with the mainstream narrative or you ask too inquisitive of questions, yeah, you get a lot of flack. Um, yeah. But I think there are lots of benefits to us doing that and very little negatives. So I that's agree. like really heartwarming, I guess it's heartwarming and it's, um, it's just nice to know. I, I had no idea about that. Yes. Well, let us know what you guys think. It's validating. <laughs> Do you remember the Chad Doerman case? Of Adam. course it is. I don't think the images that my imagination put in my head when we were talking about that story are images that I don't know if I'm going to not be able to think of, uh, and including how calm and weird it was to see him right after being arrested. So, yes, I yeah. absolutely remember. So, if you don't know, Chad Doerman um, is the accused in a case out of Ohio where he allegedly shot all three of his young boys, um, Clayton, who was seven, Hunter, who was four, and Chase, who was three, execution style in the family home's yard as their mother and their sister frantically tried to save them. Um, and then the sister ran and got help. Uh, it, it was a really hard case um, to look into, uh, read the documents and, and not, the accounts of what happened. It's not allegedly. He confessed. He did absolutely confess. Um, and by all accounts, seems totally, I mean, he's guilty. Yeah. But now his counsel are trying to argue his rights have been violated. And are trying to get his confession suppressed. 
Yeah, good luck with that one. It's a video recorded confession. Um, it is when he is being arrested and he he says straight up to the cops that, uh, you know, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to do anything else to anybody. Uh, you know, it, it's very clear he is talking directly about what he just did. So, I mean, good luck. Good yeah. Luck. So there was a video that went, it went around the internet quite a bit. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know if it went viral, but I would kind of, it kind of did where, you know, the cops were apprehending him and he was just sitting on the front porch with a gun. Um, was he smoking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he was smoking. Um, and all three of the boys are laid in the yard and that part's blacked out and redacted, of course, to the public. Mm -hmm. Um, and the officers, you know, they get him, um, they're holding him at gunpoint until they get to him. And then they, you know, put him on the ground and arrest him and everything. And I don't know. And what he's you're gonna... so cool, calm and collected. Yeah. He is like, I'm not going to hurt you guys. And then they're trying to walk into the car and he's like, Hey man, can you get my wall? And they're like, just shut up. You have the right to remain silent. So yeah. use it. And, the cops and then he didn't goes do anything wrong in my opinion. No, that's not what the lawyers oh, okay. are talking about. Okay. They're talking about, after that video cuts off and he goes to the police station and they interrogate him, he confessed. He even confessed to have been planning this for months. He confessed straight up. So what they're saying is that he asked for a lawyer and they went on for hours and never brought it up again and didn't get him a lawyer. And that he was read his Miranda rights, but they didn't give him a written copy um, or a waiver to sign. That's fine. His confession was given before that. So. What? When, when he's being arrested, he, he very clearly alludes to the fact that he did this, not to mention he gathered the them and laid them in the front yard. So. I don't know. It, maybe this is just an approach to make it seem like the defense attorney is doing his job and, and trying to defend him. But in my opinion, if they have him uh, on video being verbally uh, said his Miranda rights, that is acceptable. That is acceptable uh, as evidence. So even if they want to try and argue the fact that while he's in the police station, because they didn't give him a copy or a signed copy or whatever, um, they, they're they going to take away the confession. Okay, that's fine. Then we'll just use the confession that you allude to the fact that you're no longer going to hurt anybody else, that you're done hurting people because you have your kids laid out in the front yard. You know what I mean? Like, you're, you're fighting air here. I, I mean, I agree with you, though I don't know if I agree that he alluded to in the body cam footage of being guilty. I think just him being on the front porch with the gun and a cigarette and the boys laying right there and then saying, I'm not going to hurt you, like all of that, like his behavior, where he's well, he at, says, what he's doing. Else. No. Yeah. That's when he was like, you don't have to worry about anything. I'm not going to hurt anyone else or whatever. I I don't know. I I think we'd have to go back and watch it because yeah. I'm not sure. I, I don't remember that. But, um, you know, his wife is screaming and the mother is screaming in the background saying, why did you do this? And, you know, it's it's an awful video, but like it's damning. Like, there's no way Agreed. it wasn't him. Plus, so, there's two eyewitnesses. So, like... So, what are they going to... I'm curious what they're going to accomplish by arguing this because he agreed to confess. And it sounds like he... I mean, if they didn't give him a lawyer, I'm curious, what would the court's decision be knowing, like, okay, well, technically, this is a Miranda or a constitutional right violation because you didn't get him a lawyer, but he went on to confess to everything, and we have very damning footage. It's pretty much a no-brainer that he did it. Like, how do we go about this? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sitting here. This is one of those topics where I would need a few minutes, uh, hours, whatever, 
to chew on because I don't see the benefit in the angle here. Um, I don't see any benefit to anything. I don't, it, is the attorney worried that because he gave his confession, he's not going to be able to use the angle of, you know, temporary insanity? Uh, I, I don't know. There is too much evidence. There were two women, a, a girl and, a, and his wife there, uh, that saw everything from start to finish. There is the video footage of what I believe him saying, uh, you know, it, I'm not going to hurt anyone else. You don't have to worry uh, about me. I'm not going to do anything. Um, and yeah, I'm not drunk. I'm not this. I'm not that. As his sons are literally laid out in front of him. Um, I, I don't know what the angle could be here. I don't understand. I need to chew on it a little bit and uh, and think about it. Yeah, so it sounds like he's supposed to go to trial in July, and I think that is the angle, what you were saying with the insanity plea. I think that's what they're going to do. What? Um, so be, with a confession, he's already admitted his guilt, so if they get the confession off, they're going to be able to go to trial and, and say that he's actually not guilty, that it was uh, uh, a bout of insanity? Well, see... I don't, that's why I don't understand the point of trying to get the confession suppressed because unless he said if other you're things, insane, yeah. no, if you're insane, yeah, there's no point right. in getting the confession right. suppressed, right. Yep, exactly. but unless he says other things that they're worried about could harm their insanity uh, defense, like it could harm that because he talked about planning it. Yeah. Like it's hard to have an insanity defense when when you've been planning this for oh, months. Oh yeah, that's a that's a good. Uh yeah, yeah, yeah. I I get where you're going. So there could be other details in there not about him admitting he did it, just the details around the plan. Okay, right. I got you. Yeah, I bet you that is it. I bet you. Because uh having a long-term plan would also probably make you more likely to get the DP, the death penalty, um, yep. you know, with that long-term intent there. Whereas if you have a jury who doesn't hear about that, maybe you'll just get life. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. This whole situation though, this is one of those cases where like, I personally don't have a lot of interest in it after seeing the crime and hearing about the crime because it was so hard to watch and think about and understand. And it is so very, 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 very clear cut. There is not any room for maybes. There are not any questions of who could have, there is no setup. These officers were amazing. All of them had their body cams on in a situation where they were walking into an unknown where there could be an armed assailant and where they, shots could be fired. They didn't beat the crap out of them. <clears throat> they acted yep. very, very with, with the trauma that they were going through by seeing three kids. And some of these officers have kids of that age of those ages of their own. Um, they did a amazing these cops did incredible man um no so they did a great job like think about how any human being you know listening to this right now you're in their situation walking up to this guy who just did these to these little kids like it's hard to it's hard as a human to check your own emotions and handle things correctly because it's so disturbing. It's angering. Like you just want to do the same to him, you know, and Agreed. that's human. That's yeah. human. Um, and for cops to go above and beyond and, you know, do the right thing, despite those very human natural feelings, it, it should be applauded. That's it's important. Um, especially when, you know, you have other cops you see who don't do that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it, they're also trying to say that he that that apparently some of the law enforcement inserted themselves in confidential discussions when he was talking to a medical professional, like a healthcare provider, that they forced themselves into that situation and um, like made him agree to them being there during it. I don't understand the details of that argument. Um, 
HIPAA is very, 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 very important. And I just want to be clear that in situations like this, even though these cops did uh, amazing, sure, I'm sure there are situations where a cop might have inserted themselves too much because they felt like maybe A, they were worried about the healthcare provider in front of this man who just did one of the most heinous things in their lives. Uh, or, you know, it, they were having a hard time thinking objectively from only the perspective of like what their job is or what the training book says, you know? So I feel like that could be one of those situations where it's like just a human hiccup, you know, cop, a cop wouldn't need to be held accountable in a situation like that. This would be like, Hey, make sure next time, if you're ever in a situation like this, which you probably never will be, that you're very clear about, you know what I mean? That's yeah. like just and, an overstep, like a a, 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 a blip. Well, I, I don't want to downplay constitutional rights and HIPAA, but they're important. And this is what a they defense are. lawyer is for, okay, yeah. is to dig these things out um, and to bring them to attention, bring them to surface take it in front of a judge and get it ruled on. Um, however, even if all of this is true, he still did it. Um, so I'm curious oh, yeah. how it's going to play into the trial. I'm curious how the court's going to rule on it and how they will kind of sort that out. Um, I don't know. We'll see, but let me know what you guys think. All right. So, Four Las Vegas teens plead not guilty to beating a classmate to death. Have you heard about this? I saw a headline, but I don't know anything about it. Oh, gosh. So it's a story that's definitely making its rounds. And there were actually nine arrests or nine or ten. Uh, I heard conflicting or I read conflicting information and uh, these kids um, beat up another one of their classmates. You have a mix of 17-year-olds and 16-year-olds. Um, and then you have uh, the victim who was underage. Um, and I, I'm not going to give the names because they're underage. Uh, but uh, they were caught on video in an alley. Um just horribly beating him to death. Uh, I, I haven't seen the video myself, but it says in a comment based off of uh, what police have seen that, you know, it, it's, it's a good amount of time of information or, or it's a good amount of time that this goes on by. And in the video, you can clearly see the victim in this um, not blocking himself, which is a, a, a big sign of being unconscious or being rattled enough that you don't have your, your wherewithal to block anything coming. Well, it means on. you're so, no, um, it absolutely means you're, you're not in a state of consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. And then, absolutely. So these kids continue stomping his head and beating him and he's on the ground and they're all above him, you know, circled around him and uh, he goes all the way unconscious, and they still continue. We don't know why. We don't. It doesn't talk about why. All it says is uh, they were having a disagreement. Uh, they were arguing, and that uh, these four that are charged with the murder, I'm assuming maybe they're the ones that were hitting and kicking his head, which ended up being the reason for him passing is severe brain injury. Um, he was alive for a day or two. If I remember, uh, he was declared brain dead on, or the fight. I'm sorry. The fight occurred November 1st and he was declared brain dead on November 7th. So he was being kept alive essentially by machine, hoping he would pull through, um, and these four kids got charged and all four of them are pleading not guilty. Um, it does not talk about anything. It just says that, uh, the altercation escalated and he ended up on the ground where a whole bunch of people were around him beating him. So I think every argument. single one of them should have been charged, not just four, even if the four got murder, all the rest should have gotten assault 
with some additions, or, you know, or murder too, you know. I I'm or a, manslaughter, I'm yeah, a something very, like that. Very, very, very big believer that if you were a part of a murder, oh, oh, you, know, I'll use the Gypsy Rose, okay, case. I know we talked about this, and I know some people have commented with very different feelings in that situation, but it's a very real life and good situation. So, um. She did not take part in the actual ending of the life, like that situation where a life was ended. No, however, she helped plan it. However, if she was not a part of every event leading up to that singular event, it was impossible for that murder to take place. Therefore, if you removed her from the situation, removed her from uh, giving him the time, the location, unlocking uh, the window, the weapon, all those things, uh, it would not have happened. So I think that that is just as much of being a part of it as somebody that's holding a weapon. I don't see any difference. I think both people should be charged equally because the crime couldn't happen if it wasn't for somebody unlocking a door and saying, hey, you know, da -da -da -da, they're asleep. You can come in now. Like that crime would have never happened without that. So you are just as part of it. You're equally at fault there, in my opinion. Um, so I agree with you. I think every single person that was involved there, the only time... I, I think in a situation like this where I wouldn't charge every person is if one person or however many people tried to stop them. If there was one right. person that realized like, whoa, this is past beating up, like stop, stop, stop. That's different. But if that didn't happen, then every single person needs to be charged. Absolutely. Um, I, I agree with you. I, I think all of them should be charged. Um, because they can, they all continued. And, and if some people stopped and was like, Hey, stop. Yeah. Then I don't, I don't necessarily think they should be charged with murder, but I still do think they should be charged with assault, a misdemeanor charge or something yeah. to, to um, have accountability sure. for yeah. attacking somebody and being part of a situation like that. They all need accountability. Yeah. I agree. With um, you. but murder is very different from assault. So I, I, I yeah, agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the fact that they continued, uh, continued all, when he that, wasn't blocking, continued when he was completely unconscious, completely how old unconscious. Does it say how old? Yeah. A, a mix between 16 and 17. Two of them are being tried as adults. Um, yeah, they're just, you know, older high school kids. That's, that's old enough that you know what you're doing for the most part, especially in a fight. Yeah. Absolutely. That's old enough to know, uh, without a doubt. I, I think at any age, it, somebody that is completely unconscious and not blocking them and literally looks like they're asleep. Come on, dude. I, I don't care if you're a 12 year old. I don't care if you're an eight year old. Like it is, it that's, there's no excuse for that. Um, do I agree with them being tried as adults? I, I don't know how I feel about that. I would really have to dig into this a little bit deeper. I know that they're saying, and this is this could be fabricated. I don't know. Um, the defendants are saying that the reason why they did this to him was he had a knife and he was, you know, slicing people. However, the cops say there is zero evidence of a knife and zero evidence of somebody being sliced. So, so they just made that up. <laughs> yeah, could be, could be. What's really sad is another classmate came after this, Thing, event happened and ended up picking the victim up and carrying him back to the school to get help man um oh. it's just a really sad situation because in a situation like this like when i read this um every single person's lives are forever changed that were involved in this these 10 kids whether it was like you know uh group type psychosis the you know when you get a whole bunch of people together and because there's so many people they start making bad decisions um that herd mentality whatever they just ruined their entire life they also ended a life so simultaneously you know you you have essentially 10 11 young or older kids that will never have a normal life again
Yeah, it, it's it's very tragic. Um, regardless of whether there's le- legal consequences for their actions or trauma and psychological consequences, it's it's tragic regardless. And to this boy's family, honestly, I, obviously you haven't said anything like this, but you know, it feels to me like a bullying situation. Um, it could be. It, it this feels kid that could way. have started it. Uh, from some of the information I'm, I'm gathering, he might've thrown the first punch, uh, but it still is too far. There's a very big difference between like throwing hands when you're younger, um, and stomping somebody's head when they're unconscious. That is a, a whole different ball game. When somebody is on the ground and unable to protect themselves, different ball game, dude. But I'm curious what you guys think. What a horrible situation. Um, Let me know. Yeah, that's terrible. So, a California woman stabbed her boyfriend 108 times and got off on two years probation. No, is this that one crime that we covered a while ago where they were in an abusive relationship and she was they had a following on one of the social media platforms is that this couple no she was high okay she was high on marijuana okay so her name is Bryn Spetcher Spetcher Okay. That's what I'm going to call her. Bren Spetcher. Um, She got two years of probation and 100 hours of community service for stabbing and killing her boyfriend, Chad Omelia, 108 times after they smoked marijuana together. And she was, she had faced up to five years in prisons prior to that because the defense and the state both agreed she suffered like a psychotic in like it was um yeah. induced psychosis sure what i don't look i don't know how i feel about that i i know that there are some people out there that literally cannot handle marijuana like full on freak out change yeah, me. of personality uh and what could cause a situation like this? I don't know. Once a substance gets involved and you're the type of person that is like right on the line of what substances do to you and how far out they take you, I think that the variables involved uh, to determine where that's going to go are unlimited. So I don't know. I it, it doesn't sound like enough. I'll tell you that. It, it doesn't. Straight up. It, 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 this doesn't seem fair. It feels like it should be some kind of manslaughter charge and maybe, you know, five years total served or something like that. I feel like that could be more fair. Um, but I would need to know the details around that. I would need to know the evidence uh, after she did it. Are there cameras? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, all of those things are important. Um, The details of the case are important. But it immediately makes me think of Taylor Shabiznis, who I believe did experience a meth-induced psychosis. And meth is much more well-known for causing something super severe um, like that. Uh, And we're talking about marijuana, now, it has a mild psychoactive effect, like psychedelic effect, um, and some people it affects more, and there are rare instances of it causing psychosis, but this, it's a lot. Uh, it's a lot, I and I, I, I feel like the difference, I mean, again, we don't know every detail of her case, but it makes me wonder and don't get me wrong, what Taylor Shabiznis did, that was horrid. It was disgusting, and I do think she should be in prison. But it makes me wonder if the justice system went so much harder on Taylor because it was meth. 
and she was an addict and they don't consider something like pot addictive and it's legal and it's a different, you know, they think of it differently. What if it was alcohol? You know what I mean? Yeah. I, what if, what if it, you know what I mean? Like, I, it, what is the difference? I don't understand the difference between legal and illegal drugs when it comes to something like this, because regardless, you took a substance and they're yeah, all the same to me. I agree. That's why I'm saying that I, I do not feel like this feels fair enough. I, I could see a manslaughter charge. I've known people who were drinking and got into a fight where they threw one punch and somebody ended up dying because both of them were drinking and they got like 10 years, dude. So uh, I, I agree. I don't feel like this feels fair. This is a violent crime. And I know a ton of people who are doing a ton of time for only a drug related charge, not a violent crime. So like in the standards of expectations around like the justice system, this does not feel fair. However, I still would like to know those details because is there a ton of evidence proving she was literally gone? You know I wanted what I mean? to cover this as a full case this week, but I didn't because, um, there was other things I really wanted to talk about. And I was like, ah, I'll just cover this as an update. Um, so I didn't dig into the evidence as deep because we don't normally do that on breaking news. Yeah. This was just all over the news because people were saying it's a slap in the face to the victim's family. They yeah. didn't get true justice. She has to complete a hundred hours of public education on the dangers of THC consumption. Yeah. It doesn't feel that fair. That sounds ridiculous. Um, really ridiculous but it's also interesting that she used three knives three different knives strange yeah that's very strange yeah it is it is really strange but um i assume there must be really good evidence proving her psychosis though i that's the only reason i could come to that would support why. So apparently a body cam from a Ventura County Sheriff's Office um, was introduced as evidence in the trial and it showed a deputy using a stun gun on her four times and another deputy hitting a knife with a metal baton multiple times before finally knocking it away from her. Sounds like the cops literally came there and fought her. Yeah. Tased her four times and tried to knock the knife out of her hand. Jeez. So that's if there's body cam footage of her raging like that, that's that was probably really convincing to the jurors because when yeah. people are in a psych in psychosis, they normally have like superhuman strength. A taser doesn't take them out as easily as a Correct. normal person. Yeah. There's We've covered this actually, yeah. yeah. About the, you know, the differences or similarities to a mental break and and how it overrides like your um the the reduction of your your muscle usage, how really like most humans only use like 60% or half of their muscles or whatever. And when you're in a, a psychosis, like all those protection barriers that your brain has are are down. So you're like the Hulk, you know? Yeah. It's crazy. It's so weird. I wish I could just induce that without the psychosis. Just out, I know. Yeah. <laughs> then you would literally be like a soup, like a, a hero in real life. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, it sounds like they had experts on the stand that really backed this, um, this theory of the case. Um, it sounds like even the prosecutors after consulting, you know, psychologists reduced their charges against her. The fact that the state agrees with it makes me think that there probably is some merit to it. But there's also another another argument to it and i guess i'll leave it to you and you guys let me know what you think in the comments and this is how um 
one of the lawyers feels about it that is quoted, though I don't know how to pronounce his name. I'm not even going to try it because I will butcher it. He said, when you smoke weed and you're a white, young, privileged, upper middle class woman who bamboozles an old white male judge and you get to walk, I don't know how to reconcile that uh, for all the other criminals and victims in the country. Do you feel like this is a case of privilege? Mm. Is it not fair? Did Was justice not served? Yeah. Um, I don't know because it seems like there is good evidence for her having psychosis. And I do know that's a possibility, though it's rare. Um, and I have my own issues that I've experienced with it. But it seems like such an extremely violent crime to get two years probation and that's it. So I don't know if you want me to dig further into this case and really take a look at the trial and all of the evidence and discovery and all of that, let me know. Um, and I can do a full case on it, but until then leave your opinions and ideas in the comments. Hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of bodies found behind a Mississippi prison a prison spark community wide outrage. So, um, have you heard about this yet? How there's like a couple hundred, few hundred bodies that have been found in unmarked graves in Mississippi and Jackson. No. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it's really strange. I cannot find a ton of information about it. Uh, I, I, it says over 200 bodies were found alongside unmarked graves at at Hins or Hines County Rupers Poppers Cemetery located behind a prison in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, a news reporter continues to surface and make regional and national headlines. Family members of the deceased are seeking action. So it sounds like they haven't put uh, a lot of resources into finding out exactly what was going on here, but it seems like based on everything that I've researched that all the bodies are tied to and or related to the prison. But what's weird is there were a couple of statements of people that were related to these uh to one of the bodies or 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 whatever and uh they said that they weren't even told that their family member died they they were in prison uh and then gone they ended up filing a missing person and finding out way later that they had passed and it just sounds like whatever was going on here and it says in multiple of these articles that Mississippi is known for being pretty corrupt in the way that it manages it is. Uh, its, uh, its prisoners. It is. And uh, it's just disgusting that they didn't have the respect for a human in this way. It doesn't matter if they're prisoners. That doesn't just because you did something wrong and you're being held accountable in the justice system that is owned and controlled and voted for by the general public doesn't mean you lose your human rights. And this almost feels like that's what was going on here. Like, yeah. oh, you're just a prisoner. Like, who cares? You don't have no rights, you yeah, know? And you, they're just burying them randomly because you, what? A guard beat them to death or something you still have constitutional rights um you still have human rights and those absolutely deserve to be respected um you know i is, do you know if this was a private or a state prison do you have any idea almost guarantee it's a private prison i can almost um, guarantee it's a but private. It, I mean, it has to be, but you know how many stories I've heard of families saying that their loved one passed away or they can't get into contact with them in prison. And if they do pass away and are told, they don't get to know how they passed away. They don't get to know anything. It's ridiculous. Like in this day and age that you have, I'm sorry, it's just like the six Mississippi officers who beat that man to death or, or sh not, no, tortured those two men to death I know. and then shot one and they survived, but he was permanently disfigured uh, who did it because they were racist. Like yeah. Mississippi still has some really backwards politics, law enforcement, um, government 
very backwards, unfortunately, from a lot of the things I've seen coming out of there, like the Eddie Parker and um, tragedy that happened last year to this, this had to have been going on for so long and prisoners were passing away and they wanted to keep getting paid for those prisoners by not reporting them dead. Oh, I didn't think and hiding them and burying them out back. And maybe it was also cases of brutality and murder by prison guards or prisoners. Maybe they have gangs running crazy in here, you know, who are controlling the place entirely. And those are all their, you know, victims out back. Like there's many aspects that could be a part of this, but this is absolutely corrupt and wrong. And this needs to be investigated very deeply. And this kind of stuff should not, there should be enough oversight. This isn't possible. There shouldn't be somebody who goes missing in the prison system. That shouldn't happen. I agree. And, you know, I've often wondered because we've talked about the prison system quite a bit and it, is there not a federal, uh, like the federal government just needs to hire one person that is specialized in all things prison, prison law, standards, yeah. expectations, that is a, a government employee, that their whole job is traveling from prison to prison to prison to prison to make sure that these private prisons are up to the standards and offering these uh, prisoners their human rights, that they're due and owed regardless of if they're a prisoner of the state or the federal government it doesn't matter uh to to help prevent situations like this because i agree this is horrible i didn't even think about it from the point of view that you know they just wanted to continue uh getting paid because these private prisons do get paid per inmate um but i i agree i think there needs to be a very in-depth and lengthy and complex investigation talking to anybody that was working there from the time that they find out these bodies started until the end. You know, most of these didn't even have markers there. And and the ones that did was like a metal pole sticking out of the ground, a tree branch, like weird random markers. Like, These are human beings, not just human beings, but citizens of the U.S., man. And how many of them were in there for small infractions like, you know, carrying a bag of weed or, you know, getting in a fight or, you know, just stupid stuff? How many were innocent? Like it just because they're in prison doesn't mean they're the worst of the worst. You know, I agree with you. So and even if they are, they still have rights, whether we like it or not. I agree with you. I mean, I, I think I like them to have rights. They should have rights. They should because people make mistakes and we should offer them accountability and the possibility to change how they do things. Exactly. You know? Rehab, rehabilitate them to realize the benefits of following the laws of the citizens and our public and the U S. So, um, it's so if messed we're up. Just doing things like this and then burying them behind a prison without letting family know, without giving them a proper burial. Are we even following the law and no. making sure that it's sanitary here? Because you cannot just put hundreds of bodies straight up in dirt. Like even when they've done it in in times of war, they follow certain protocols with lie and things like that to 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 uh, increase the decomp so that it doesn't poison the ground and stuff. Um, But that's not, that's a side note here. First, they need to figure out who each of these people are family members to why they're dead, how they're dead and when they died and then start digging into those records, man, because something's up here. Something is up and it's really sad that prison is not rehabilitation in our country whatsoever. Not at all. It is the place where you go to become a better criminal or to die. Yeah. That's what prison is. Um, very few people learn from going to prison. Um, and for those people that do learn, it's absolutely miraculous. Yeah. But let me know what you guys think. You, you, you. Leave it in the comments below. 
We have some updates in the three men that were found frozen and passed away in a backyard in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. Um, You remember we covered this last week and you were talking about it, saying they were found after like going to watch um, a Chiefs game at their friend's house. And we didn't know anything. Nothing. Well, we still don't know much, but we know a little bit more. So if you didn't see last week, uh, we know all the names um, now, but here's a basic rundown. So Ricky Johnson, David Harrington, and Clayton McGinney's bodies were discovered on January 9th. This was two days after they got together um, to all watch uh, the Kansas City Chiefs game at their friend Jordan Willis's home uh, on January 7th. Uh, McGinney's fiance got worried because she hadn't heard from him since then and went looking for him at Willis's house where she saw him dead on the back porch. Mm. She called the police. Uh, the police responded and came and found two him and two more bodies in the backyard. Um we it was it's been mystery and there's been a lot of speculation um around what could have happened to these men because it's so strange how do they all get together you know crack a few beers eat some snacks and watch a game and end up dead on the back porch it just doesn't make a lot of sense so far, the police are all saying they have, even now, have found no evidence of foul play at all. But apparently, Willis's attorney, John Perkino, P- Pacino, Perserno, mm-hmm. something like that. Okay, we're just going to call him John, <laughs> so I don't butcher his last name. But he says they're waiting the autopsy and the toxicology results um, that he had no idea that they were back there, that after the game, he went to bed. Willis went to bed and felt comfortable going to bed because it's his friends at the house and had no idea for those two days that his friends were all out there dead. He yeah. went to bed and had no clue. We also have a report saying there was a fifth man there, but he left a couple hours before Willis went to bed. Oh, geez. Okay. Now, that's strange. Like, how do you go to bed and then for two days not notice all three of your friends that were there are not answering the phone, not texting back, and are literally laying in your backyard dead? Well, to be fair, I. If it's more understandable than eight hours after being home when a violent crime occurred, yeah, but I get it more. Yeah, yeah I, I guess I guess so. There, there have been times where I haven't gone in my backyard for a long time, especially if you live at a house where you park out in the front. There might be a week, two weeks, three weeks before you go in the backyard. Two of the victims' cars were found out front, parked on the street. Okay, that's so, more weird. Yeah, because he would have noticed his friend's cars yeah. are still there. Yeah. It is weird. More weird. Um, yeah. He apparently had come and gone from his house several times sporadically during those two days. So it's a bit odd he didn't notice his friend's cars never moving or leaving. Um. Nothing really seems to add up. So I have an article here from the New York Post, um, and it's from the parents of one of the men. It's uh, Ricky Johnson's father saying he thinks that Willis had something to do with it. Um, And it's more information about who Willis is. So... Um, he is an HIV data scientist. Okay. I heard a bunch of rumors going around saying he was a chemist and that doesn't appear to be true. He's an HIV scientist. Um, I don't know where the chemist part of this is coming from. So if I'm wrong on that and there's some other information out there I'm aware of, definitely let me know. Um, 
But that's interesting. He's a scientist. And we also, in this article, have information that some of these men have done drugs in the past. Okay. I but mean, what? Who hasn't? All, right. But the family members feel like they're all really um, responsible adults. Like pretty straight laced. Yeah. yeah. They're yeah. all very responsible adults and that this... They're concerned because they do not feel like this makes sense. Um, and he essentially makes the allegation that all three of those men were drugged and then dragged outside. Oh, I, and is there evidence of this? Uh... So, so one theory that I had kind of going around in my mind, and it was after Cluminati had a live about it, and I only got to see a small part of it, but somebody was mentioning them drinking and the possibility of some, getting something laced, which right now, that is a big possibility with what's going on with fentanyl. You could buy marijuana and get it laced. You know, you could buy... Yeah, One drug that, that goes really well with alcohol um, for a lot of people is cocaine. And that is a very easy to lace because fentanyl is a white powder, you yeah. know? And there's also uh, that one girl that we talked about a while ago that uh, she was a college student and uh, had a bunch of papers due. So she bought what she thought was an Adderall and took a quarter of it. <sighs> and because it was... Not scientifically manufactured and created, which has a reliable spread of, uh, you know, the the deadly or important chemicals in the fillers and things like that. She happened to get a piece that had enough fentanyl in it to OD multiple people. And all she took was a quarter of what she thought was an Adderall and yeah. died. And I also heard on that Cluminati's live stream, somebody, I'm not sure, she had a few people talking. Somebody said, well... If they had something laced and it had fentanyl in it, I know that makes people not able to breathe. So maybe they ran outside and passed out and froze to death. I, I just want to say that's not how it works. Yeah. It, so it does depress breathing. That is accurate. But you don't feel it like that. It's not like all of a sudden, oh my gosh, I can't breathe. No, you're passing out simultaneously and your breathing is being depressed. Yeah, once it gets so, to that point, it's like this. Yeah, you just do this. And, and then your lips start turning yeah. blue. And it's like, it looks like you're falling asleep, but then color changes will start to happen. You're not aware enough no. to run outside. No. It's not even possible. Yeah, That is nodding not how, out. yeah, nodding out. That is not how this drug works at all. No. So that's, no. I don't put any validity in that and I'm not calling them out. I just, it's, I think I know no, it's important to, to, yeah. to be clear on what can or can't happen. Yeah. It's not about calling anybody out. Nobody's right or wrong. This is just learning together. And some people are going to have more knowledge than other people will because of life experiences and things yeah. like that. Um, and, uh, you know, it, We've just been around people in person firsthand, not once, not twice, tens, if not hundreds of times and have firsthand seen this happen uh, due to, you know, past stuff and whatnot. So, um, yeah, it, they would if you're at the point of your breathing being depressed and you feel like you're in it, you wouldn't feel like you were in danger. No, that would never happen. You, you would just OD and die. So there's these stories. To give an example, just to back up what I'm saying, you guys can look this up. I try and give examples that you can look up. Um, there are EMTs out there that are scared to uh, hit people um, that are ODing on opiates with uh, Narcan, with Narcan or, or norepinephrine or or not nor the uh, the the adrenaline one, it's oh, okay. noradrenal something. Um, but no, they used to do it in a mix and they were scared of doing that because somebody that's literally dying, like if this EMT didn't give them this, they would have died a hundred percent. They'll give them the drug to save them and they'll get up and try and fight them because they're so mad that they made them not feel as good as they were feeling. But Hey dude, you, you might've felt good, but you were dying. Like, right. All you your vitals, gone. all your vitals are going down. You're turning colors. Like I've personally seen ODs in person. 
Um, I've been around when they've happened. I have literally saved people's lives. So I know, I know that's, this is how it works the way we're saying. Um, so I just don't think that is a possibility. Um, I, I they would have to have been using it outside for that to yes, happen if yes. they were using it. So it would smoked, uh, which is pretty rare, but can happen. Um, it just, oh, it's hard. I don't know. I don't know. Now, and you would be able to tell if they were doing anything injectable like IV because there would be blood splotching and 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 an entrance wound and things like that. Um, so yeah, I don't know. And and it's it, a weird one. So in the the toxicology and the autopsy are going to be vital in this case to determine if the bodies were moved after death. Um, also, it, there's snow outside. So if they were dragged, it, I think it would be pretty, it depends on if there was snow on the ground before or after the bodies ended up where they ended up. Because if there was snow before, then the cops could clearly see dragging marks. Yeah. They could clearly see other people's footprints. So the fact that they're saying they don't see foul plays is, is interesting. Like it, it makes me wonder, did they have jackets and coats on? It was only 33 degrees outside. Um, that's not, that's cold enough, but that's not even below freezing. Yeah. So it's like, how could all three of these men end up that way? It's not negative. Like if we were talking negative 40, like it was in Illinois and, you know, Iowa and Montana, like all these Midwest Northern States a couple weeks ago, if we were talking negative 40, that oh, yeah. would be a different story. Oh, yeah. Completely. Different. Um, but the fact that it was 33 which is a degree above freezing, it, it makes it even more questionable to me. Um, I, I, I don't, honestly, I don't, the only thing I could think with drugging is possibly getting something that's laced, but that would have to mean, like you said, they were doing it outside and hanging out outside and it would probably be smoking. You know, if you've ever heard of people dipping cigarettes in certain things or lacing marijuana, there's many ways you could get something laced. Smoking it outside because they don't allow smoking in the house, maybe. Um, or did it inside and yeah, the bodies were placed out there. But it seems like there would be indicators the cops could see pretty clearly that they were moved. Yeah, you would think so. You would think so. Um, but it is really strange, and the families have big concerns, which I completely understand. This is very concerning to me as well. Um, and those autopsy and toxicology uh, results are going to be vital. Um, and it's interesting that man is a scientist. Like, that's really weird. Yeah, maybe. I It, it just depends. So chemist would be much more interesting. Scientist isn't as interesting because scientists yeah. can mean a million things. What's interesting is that he is a data scientist. Okay. So I expect him to work with uh, data figures and data sets and charts and uh, planning and uh, looking for trends and things like that. That's what I'm assuming the kind of scientist he is, is I would assume if he's an HIV data scientist, then he is gathering and or managing data from HIV patients uh, to see effectiveness of medication, yeah. uh, continuing to work on, uh, you know, uh, the medication to, uh, to resolve HIV in general. You know, we still don't have something to cure it completely. So, um, it, it's, that's very different than a chemist, right? When, when you hear chemist, I bet most people connect like breaking bad, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but, well, uh, well, yeah. I mean, a chemist would be very, very interesting or involved somehow in pharmaceutical research, scientists formulate anything like that. I'd be like, Whoa, that's, that's strange. Um, but here's another detail real quick before I wrap this up. Um, whoa. Okay. So the victim's relatives said that when police officers respond to the house, Willis met them at the door in his boxers with an empty wine glass in his hand. And this is two days later and he was drinking. Yeah. Um, so he also, it says Willis's attorney told the news outlet that the stemware, the, the wine glass contained 
um, water and had been refilled after being used to drink wine the night before. Um, also, he was asleep on the couch. And the last memory Willis has is of them leaving out the front door and he doesn't know what happened until the police came Tuesday night to his house. Wait, what? So he thinks he maybe he was drugged? I don't know. No. The, so he has two days of memory missing? No, he, nobody said he has two days of memory missing. He, you just said the last memory he has. Of that night. Oh, Is oh, him oh, falling it, asleep on the couch, and he has a memory of them walking out the front door. And then he doesn't know what happened to them. Until mm. the police came to his house and were like, there's dead bodies in your backyard. Okay. Whoa. But again, I told you the victim's cars or, you know, the deceased people's cars were out parked on the street still. And he had left his house multiple times. I, I get it. I look. And it is odd that he had this, drank wine and everything again. Like how often does this man drink? This is more plausible to me than, like I said, jokingly, the Idaho four story. It's very different to having, uh, you know, being drunk, openly drunk and, uh, falling asleep inside. We don't even know what ended these guys. If these guys were ripped apart by a knife, you would assume that would be something really loud and would like wake somebody up. But the autopsy is going to be essential here. I, I don't know. I think it's very possible he might not be involved. I think it's possible that he could be involved. I think everything is going to hinder on what that autopsy says. Everything. Because I could see somebody, I could see this being true. There has it's, to be something in common with all three of them that he was not a part of. If he had nothing to do with it, that mean, has to mean they either ingested something that he did not. Or, I mean, it almost feels like a case of poisoning. Like, it, it feels so weird. You know? Like, it's yeah. really strange. It is. And it, uh, from what we're seeing, it sounds like there's no apparent... There was nothing apparent that showed, like, this is how they died. This is, like, foul play. Yeah. Somebody hurt it, them. or There's nothing. It's probably going to be some kind of poisoning, but still, normally there's evidence of a poisoning. Um, you know, the, it, poisoning doesn't happen easy. Normally, you uh, your body tries to get rid of everything as quickly right, as you're gonna can. Right, you're going to expel things. From everywhere. Yeah. Um, there is also some additional, uh, what's that called, when certain blood vessels break, yeah. when there's pressure and things like that. So a lot of times around your eyes. You can you have discoloration show, in different parts. Yeah, show some of that or bleeding. Um, yeah, inside and normally the, you can yeah, tell. Bleeding yeah. inside the body in different places. Plus it changes uh, the decomp rate and a lot of things like that. So Yeah, yeah. so I mean, this I, is interesting. I really hope that the autopsy they're doing is a forensic autopsy, which I would assume it would be because uh, there is a difference in autopsies. Um, but we'll see. I'm going to keep my eyes on it because it's a, it's a true mystery and I'm really really curious where this is going to go it's super sad because you know these men were husbands fiancés fathers sons brothers and they all sounded like they were all pretty respectable and you know nice guys and it's it's pretty sad they went to their friend's house to watch the game and that was it it it's is. super strange, but let me know your opinions, your theories, what you think happened here, uh, or if you have any additional information, uh, you live in the area or you just found something, let me know in the comments. Let us know. All right, so we are digging right into the first case of tonight, and it is going back into the Idaho 4 case. We're going to be talking about the trial and all things having to do with Brian Koberger, who is the current main suspect of the Idaho 4 massacre. Brian Koberger is the uh, doctorate criminology student that is currently sitting in Latah County Jail uh, waiting for his trial. And uh, 
We just had some uh, search warrants released on January 23rd of 2024, and uh, they are in reference to what date? Uh, They were originally filed. These unsealed search warrants were uh, originally filed September 12th, 2023. All right. And we have three of them here. Well, first we have order setting sealed hearing on defendant's motion to unseal. Um, That's just setting a sealed hearing to talk further about these and the motion to unseal. Um, not further about these, but the motion to unseal that we talked about just recently. Uh, then we have order to seal and redact meta platforms, order to seal and redact Microsoft, order to seal and redact TikTok. And essentially, like, all right, I'll go through who the first one applies to. So the first one applies to meta platforms and Instagram in parentheses. So essentially, it's asking for Um, any of the data associated with meta platforms. And for those of you that don't know, meta platforms is Facebook and Instagram. And when you're logged into the meta business login or personal login, it is both accounts in there. Uh, And it actually highlights a few things in here like pokes uh, having to do with messenger uh that's tied to instagram but it looks like they're it's tied to facebook uh facebook yeah facebook is the pokes yep and uh but they're going to be specifically looking more into the instagram stuff for at least this search warrant here uh and and honestly my original plan was to read through all this but it's so many details i can tell you what they're looking for Everything associating associated with that account. And that means anybody who interacted with them in that account. That includes that person's IP addresses, um, any uh, screen names, any uh, location services, literally any payments, payments, anything tying to tying to their personal accounts of Zana, Madison, and Kaylee. Uh, everything. And we'll get into that just a little bit uh, in an open conversation forum. Now, we also have OneDrive, uh, Microsoft Corporation, OneDrive. And for those of you that don't know, OneDrive is a software, a program that is attached to a Microsoft account. You don't have to have a Microsoft account, but it's essentially a storage system that allows you to save anything, connect different things, seamlessly share information and pictures. Um, is it a cloud? Um, yeah. And this one, by the way, I wanted to mention, this one was um, filed August 28th, 2023, originally, this warrant. Okay, okay. Um, awesome. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it can be a cloud. I think that I always, I'm always unsure of whether I should use the term cloud except in specific situations because there's a lot of operating systems and things out there that aren't specifically clouds. Um, this is, and isn't, this is just a program. Um, but there is cloud storage, uh, associated with it. Now, Uh, I wouldn't say that it is all cloud focused or anything like that. Um, So I I just want to be clear, you know, that it's not a cloud service system, but it does have cloud storage associated with it. Um, And it's asking for, again, all things attributed to it. You're talking everything from accounts, email accounts, passwords, pins. Uh, Clearly, they believe that it is tied directly to cell phones because they're asking for IMEI numbers, which if you guys have watched our past videos about uh, cell phone coverage, that is a cell phone or tablet or um, computers, social security number. You know what I mean? And it's asking for all things associated with that. Again, financial, uh, photos, um, search history. And we're going to be talking about the IMEI uh, OneDrive Res ID information. Um, Now, for the third one, we have TikTok. And this one's interesting. So this one's specifically asking for Ethan Chapin's TikTok account with any of the following email addresses redacted, of course. 
um, Dylan Mortensen's TikTok account, um, Bethany Funk's email and TikTok account, uh, and everything associated with all of them. Um, so if you guys are interested in hearing all the details about it, you can check it out. We will have a video out there posting all of them. So, um, I've seen some conversation out there around this a little bit, and I guess I'll go into the first thing here before we dig into, uh, the other two and let's, let's dig into the Microsoft OneNote IMEI. Okay. okay. Now. It's interesting, all right, you guys. So let me, let me explain it here. So if I have a OneDrive and I had a video on there and I wanted to share that with you, I could have this storage space in my OneDrive and send you an invite to give you access to that system. So essentially, we could be trading, talking, watching following up on information and invite certain people to it. Now I'm interested that they want that IMEI. I'm interested because we've been told uh, and have seen firsthand that the defense has come out and said, Hey, there is nothing tying my client to these people. Yeah. So this account is not the geolocation background data type account I would expect to see when they're looking for that specifically. And clearly, based on this request, they are looking for specific data. Specific data here. Like what? I Like we just talked about, literally everything from phone numbers to uh, invites to IMEIs. I mean, we just went through it. Everything, IP addresses, everything. So it's interesting what they think to think what they're looking for. Now, some people have asked this because it says search warrant, IMEI and OneDrive Res ID. So when you're talking about uh, OneDrive specifically, more than likely what I would assume it is uh, is it stands for resource ID, which essentially is that sharing feature that I just explained to you where I could create a OneDrive, all right, and then uh, invite you and offer. Well, it, it's going to create an identification number for that saved storage because essentially just imagine you're in a room and uh, all the information you want is in a drawer, right? And you pull that drawer out, you pull it out when you're ready, you do whatever you got to do, put it back in that drawer, and then put it away. And you you have all your drawers numbered, so you know exactly where certain things are at in your room of drawers, right? That's essentially what I believe that res ID is. However, however, there is another option here, too. So there is uh, also a uh, res ID that is associated with audio accounts. It's audio accounts? Yep. What do you mean? It is programming that can reverse engineer and break down audio data information. Now, I haven't done enough digging to find out if this is an if this is a program that OneNote offers. I have no idea if uh, you mean OneDrive or OneDrive offers. Yeah, OneDrive offers. Uh, OneNote's a different part of the Microsoft, uh, you know, whatever uh, platform. But ResID is a C plus plus library containing a complete emulation of the SID chips. This library can be linked into program emulating uh, the MPU to play music made for a Commodore 64 computer. The res ID has been linked uh, with multiple different programs and into the trackers, geo trackers, cheese cutter, goat tracker, res ID is a reverse engineered software emulation sound interface chip programmed by dag lem this chip was used in a 64 computer um but yeah 
really interesting that it has to do with audio and uh, sound interface devices. So I don't believe it's that, but I wanted to be able to give that example. The reason why I don't believe it's that is because it specifically says one note res ID. But when that popped up, that's what I thought about first is that sound uh, programming, but interesting, right? Yeah, it is it is interesting. Um, I just don't, I don't know what OneDrive is. Like, I've never used it before, so. Yeah. Like, how can they the request storage. an IMEI? Does that just mean the IMEI of the device that was using that account? Um, no, I think that it's every IMEI that was attached and or associated with that account. That's OneDrive, funny. OneDrive, yeah, but you're you're thinking singular. It's not singular. Okay. It's anybody who had access. Okay, but that's what I meant. IMEIs that are part of that account. Yeah, yeah, because there's the main IMEI, but it, it, it says in here that it's asking for anything connected to it. So there would be a main IMEI, right? So when you log into an account and, and or you create an account, it saves your IP address information as your home IP. Uh, and every device has a specific, um, essentially IMEI. I'll just use the term IMEI because it's used in here. Uh, but it, it has its own IMEI. So the program knows if you're logging into your home device, it knows if you're logging into your home computer or home phone or whatever. And then it will also keep track of other phones that have been invited to um, that storage as well. Hmm. So it could be a whole multitude of information. And we don't know who this is for. We don't know who this is for. And what's really interesting here is if they have proof that Brian Koberger was somehow tied to these victims in this circumstance, this would be proven like without a doubt. This would be unarguable. What do you mean? Like if they found something here? Yeah, if they found something here. But isn't it interesting that they're digging into like the victims and the roommates information? Yeah. You know? I think they're looking it's for... It's eye-opening. Yeah, I think they're looking for anything they can to connect him to them. They are, that's what I feel like is going on here because these are filed towards the end of the year of last year when the defense was like trying to get the IgG like I'm so curious what was going on behind the scenes because we don't know we have no idea what was going on behind the scenes I agree we only saw that you know that's all we saw was they were going after the grand jury indictment they were going after the IgG like they were going after all these things and then they start digging more into the victims and the surviving roommates which is what they should Background, have been doing. They should have done that already. Right away. Yep. It should have been number one. It should have been. Well, and they have their actual phones. Yeah. They have them. Yeah. 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 Not yeah. the survivors. I, I to, assume they would have fair, taken a copy of the survivors' phones, but look, they have all the victims' phones. Look, to be fair, I have seen some video videos comment on that. And look, I it so people that are tech knowledgeable are few and far between. But for whatever reason, I find that in the tech industry, everyone wants to be seen as like very tech knowledgeable. But if I had to give a, a percentage, I would say probably less than 5% of people in the US are actually tech knowledgeable. Now, if you're talking about the importance of the police having their phones, I, I've got to tell you, I got to break it to you. Um, that doesn't matter. Them having their phones is meaningless. I could get access to their phones, everything in it. So what you're Without saying is them. the like, search, I don't need them. The search warrants to go back and look at all of this history is what matters. That's what matters. The phones don't matter. And honestly, I'm really surprised they haven't just given them back. So uh, law enforcement has the ability to copy a device. It takes well, it depends on how much data they have on there, but all I, and I like, we've sold these devices to them, uh, companies I've worked with. 
Um, so I know all about them. So depending on how much information is in that phone, it, it could be 10 minutes. It could be a couple hours, you know, if it's a, a large phone and they don't need to have them anymore. So why they're continuing to hold them, I don't know. Number two, you don't need them. If I had somebody's IMEI information and I had their SIM information and uh, a way to verify the account, depending on if they're using two-step verification or not, um, I don't need that to gain access to their entire phone. So if I don't, police doesn't. They're way more advanced than I ever am. Yeah, and the family, um, the Gonzalez family, have said they want that stuff back and sure. that they're waiting on, like, the law enforcement is literally going to give them a copy of Kaylee's phone, yeah, that's not her phone. The only thing that I could think is if it's being used specifically as evidence, because, yes, a phone used as evidence is a very good uh it's a very it's a good item to be able to pull out if you need to land an argument. You know what I mean? In court. Like, I get it. But if you're getting pushback, you don't need it. You could hold up any phone and say this is their phone. You know what I mean? And get the same. It, it would land the same kind of oomph that, you know, their phone would be. So I. I'm curious. I, I don't know exactly. Uh, I don't think that it's beneficial to say OneDrive is all cloud related because it's not. Uh, it's part of Microsoft's suite of programs. That's what I meant to say earlier. The, uh, the Microsoft suite. Um, and Microsoft suite has a whole multitude, multitude of different programs essentially for anybody who needs anything having to do with a computer. The OneDrive happens to be uh, their storage, um, their uh, the ability to essentially transfer your data anywhere to anyone at any time and back it up. And you know what I mean? From, from anywhere. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting that now they want to dig into their one note in for, or I'm sorry, at that point, dig into their one note information. It's interesting that they're releasing this now. It is interesting, um, but I, I wanted to say it's odd that the name's redacted. And I know we brought this up in the last unsealed search warrant video, but like they included the names on the TikTok and the Instagram one. Um, and we already know they're digging into Brian Koberger and have been, and we're investigating him. He's the defendant. Oh, <clears throat> We've so. seen the victim's names on so many documents of them requesting search warrants. So why is this one redacted? Why does the name have to be redacted? Yeah, that is. That makes me think it is not Brian Koberger or the victims or the roommates, that it's somebody else. Um, yeah, yeah. I. And why? Interesting. Not the, it, I could be wrong. It could be one of you know the people involved that we already know about. But what if it's not? Because I don't understand redacting this search warrant's name. Yes. The name. I don't get it. We know of all these people. We know of all their search warrants in the past. What's the point? Well, they redacted all the information that's important. I mean, so no, I don't think they did. I think this is very eye opening. I don't think that I need to have these names to understand the connection. What's interesting here is looking for looking at the responses of Ann Taylor now knowing that all of this information was submitted before Ann Taylor came out and said, why, why do you have my defendant here? There is no connection. Well, and that, so this was before that. Therefore, meaning there is nothing here that was connected to Brian Koberger. This is before that? Yes. It's It was August 28, 2023? Yep. That didn't mean she even got the... We. She has not received discovery in a timely manner, okay? So, I mean, who knows if she had this or not. But it's for the entire 2022 year, from January 1st to December 30th, the whole year. Until his arrest date. Yep. So it kind of makes you think, well, maybe it is for Brian because it ends when he's arrested. Sure. I think that. Uh, and it's for that whole year. 
Yeah. Or maybe, I mean, because the end of the year is the 31st, not the 30th. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, we could theorize it all day long. Let's be real here. There's just no way to know. And again, what's interesting is that Ann Taylor has said that there is no connection. Yeah, she has. She publicly stated that, and that matters. It truly does. Yeah, it matters a lot. Um, and uh, so I don't think anything was found here. And this is really digging deep, you guys. This is uh, this is digging into stuff that you normally do not see in an investigation. You know what's really interesting? You know what this makes me wonder about? Do you remember the Russian hacker video we watched? Mm -hmm. Do, I wonder if, it, and I'm glad I'm seeing this stuff because I've been asking this whole time, like what is going, why are we not seeing this application background data, geolocation uh, accounts and, and all this information pulled. So I'm glad we're seeing it, that it was being done. It makes me feel a little bit better. Um, but that Russian, that so-called Russian hacker, there is no verification for it. I have no idea if they're actually Russian. I have no idea if they're actually a hacker. I have no idea if the thing was set up, but it, it, it was one of our past videos we were watching on it. They said that they reached out to Moscow Police Department and essentially said, this is your guy here. Here's the evidence. This is your guy because we were able to connect this, this, and this. Okay. He presents himself as a hacker, right? So what do you think the evidence is going to be? Background data. Technology related. Yeah. And app data related. Yes, absolutely. So did Moscow PD get something that made them do this and is digging? And it might not be him. I don't know. I don't know. We say it every time that we're not looking for his innocence or guilt. We're digging into the investigation itself because police are people and all people are trust but verify, right? And this is the verification. Right. So it, it's interesting, right? It's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it makes me wonder because, look, they're asking for – essentially what they're asking for is like – when an application has coding to write the outline and bounds of that, they're asking for everything that goes in between those. They're asking for uh, all IP addresses associated with it. Like they're asking for things that would be hard for a user to find themselves. Hmm. Yeah, right. Right. So, yeah. Which good. Good. I'm not complaining about it. I think this is what I've wanted to see the entire right. time. Yeah, I now, agree. Going into the social media, if you guys have any questions, please make sure you leave a comment down below and I will answer them for you. Um, you know, I'm very familiar with all of these apps and platforms. Honestly, I'm more familiar with like the Microsoft suite platform or uh, apps than I am even like social media, you know. Um, but going into the, uh, the meta one, yeah, the meta one here. Um, I, I think I said this in the beginning of this video, but I'll say it again, that it's in relation to meta with a heavy focus on, uh, Instagram. So for those of you that don't know, that might not have like a, a meta business account, Meta attaches your Instagram and Facebook together into one login and platform so you can manage both of them simultaneously. Within that, you get your messages, you get uh, all the functionality of reading comments, responding to comments, and everything in between. So uh, this is essentially asking, again, for everything within that. Uh, what do you think about it? I think it's in the dates I think are interesting um, that they're requesting all the way to November 21st. Uh, wait, what did I just say? November 21st, mm -hmm. which is um, like a whole week or two after they're passed away. Um, yeah. Also like from summer to then, I, I don't know. It's, 
And it's for all three of the women victims, but not Ethan. Yeah. Well, I wonder if Ethan didn't have a meta account or an Instagram account or a Facebook account. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, I thought he did. Or uh, it's it's felt like the Chapins have had information, and maybe that's why they've stayed qu more quiet than the rest of them, out of sight. Um, maybe they went out of their way to offer up the logins to police and give the consent for them oh. to have it, whereas these three did not do that. I don't know. I'm just thinking of other potential possibilities here around Yeah, but it. giving them the login, like you said, having the phone and the login doesn't matter. It's the background that does. Um, well, when it comes to like the metadata information, you would be able to get a lot more here. And what they're asking for is like the types of services, payments, um, uh, all the photos uploaded, where they've gone, who they've gone to, uh, you would be able to get a lot of these things. What you wouldn't be able to get from having someone's logged in account, um, deleted is, stuff. Exactly. Is if somebody, uh, left a comment or a thumbs up, like poke anything, and then it was deleted at a later time, uh, that would be something you would need to reach directly out to the application for. Now with what you're saying, I don't think it's weird. I don't think there's anything weird to it. I think we're seeing police actually do what i would expect police to do it does and and do not take this the wrong way you guys i know we just had a whole week of police corruption i'm not saying all of a sudden i'm like on police's side just because they're doing things right doesn't mean this takes away from all the things that we found they're doing very 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 wrong but this is what i expect to see in an investigation are are these documents right here looking into it i expect to see them go at least a couple weeks probably a few months after the crime because what we know about killers is a lot of times they come back to the scene of the crime a lot of times they continue looking them up they a lot of times they uh, return back to uh, newsletters, social media, all these things. So, you know, uh, are they looking for those identifiers? Is that what they're looking for? I assume yes, but it's interesting, right? I'm curious why they didn't go to Brian's arrest date then. I don't know. That would make the most logical sense to me. It would, but maybe there's more search warrants in here tied directly to his devices that would answer that. I don't know. Maybe they're looking at other options because we've said from the very beginning that if these cops are doing this and aren't even thinking there could be a possibility of more people involved or you know, maybe they got their theory wrong... That's a mistake. That's a very big mistake. There's yeah. no such thing as 100% certain unless you have literal video footage of somebody doing the crime. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But these are interesting. They're very interesting. Were these unsealed intentionally? Right. Are they being unsealed to try and win back confidence because we're seeing a lot of these uh, bigger names start come to coming to, to YouTube and saying, Hey, I'm seeing problems, right? Something's not right here. You know, you know what I mean? This might not even be about, I'm telling you. So, you know, what's interesting. Somebody left a comment saying, uh, what did they say? Uh, they were like, oh, yeah, of course, prosecution. Uh, of course, you're trying to say the prosecution is the one like character assassinating, um, just going off on us, right? Look, a good lawyer knows how to trial by media. Of course, I'm saying that. It's obvious. Come on. Yeah. So... Um, you know what's interesting? Hmm. The same date that those were requested is the same date Brian waived his speedy trial. 
August 23rd, right? That's what the, the, that Microsoft one and the TikTok one, uh, not the meta one. The meta one was September 12th. Okay. But August, oh, August 28th. I'm wrong, but he did just waive his speedy trial. And then the 28th was, looks like they were talking about a hearing or something. It was just media requests, but this is around that time is like him waving his speedy trial, them asking the grand jury to get, um, indictment to be, you know, yeah. And it's actually around the kind of the alibi time too. It looks like. And we had a bunch of uh, requests to seal other uh, search warrants. Amazon, Apple, PayPal, Venmo, Spotify, YouTube. That's when we covered all those. Yep. This is around that time, too. Yeah. When they ordered to seal all those and we're ordering those. So it sounds like in these like few months at the end of 2023, like September, August, um, <laughs> October... <laughs> All those months is they were really digging into apps, like really digging into them because yeah. there's a bunch of like search warrants here. And we had the waving of the speedy trial. Like, I'm so curious, like it almost feels like there was this turning point, this tipping point when everybody was like, slow down. We need to look more. Don't you feel like that? Uh, maybe I'm not sure to be, to be honest, I haven't looked into trying to put the research into a linear fashion to identify if anything is being, anything strange pops out at me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I, that's why I was just telling you. Cause like around this time he had just waived a speedy trial and then it's five days later that they put in these search warrants and then it's a month later, um, well, not even really, it's pretty close, um, that they are getting even more search warrants. Yeah. And they're really digging into app data. Which is what they should have done right in the very beginning. Well, yeah, that's what makes me curious. Like, why did they wait? Till around the time he's waving a speedy trial and trying to get the grand jury indictment overturned to start requesting all of this. Yeah. That makes me feel like maybe they expected to go to trial and didn't expect Anne to slow down and really dig into everything. Yeah, I, I think very, I think yes, yes, yes. I was just looking at the first video that we put out where we started talking about app data and things like that. And it was right around the same time that, that stuff was being requested. I know that's um, what I'm saying. Yeah, but uh, so, yeah, I think that is a very good possibility and very real theory that, uh, that, that yes, I, I don't think they expected there to be pushback here. I, I, not to this extent that Anne's going. Anne has hired an investigative investigative team, and she is literally combing through every single piece of yeah. evidence and requesting every expert report. Yeah, she wants all of it, and yeah. she wants the time to really dig through all of it. Um, and I think that they didn't expect that. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. It, it, or maybe just problems for, started coming up. For me, it just shows, again, a a lack of experience personally. Um, I, I think this should be the first mm. go-to right away as soon as they, they wondered and thought that uh, you know, Brian Koberger could be their guy. Look, it's it's a one-two punch. You look into his background and you realize, oh, he has a tech background. Oh, in criminology. Okay, what tech does he have? They should have been figuring these things out. This should have been number one. Like these into the victims' devices is what I would have expected to see in November. Uh, that's what I'm saying yeah. right there is that I don't understand when you have a homicide to this extent. And these are young kids that are constantly on their phones and posting to social media, interacting with lots of different people on the Internet. Like, why did they not immediately think, OK, 
we need to know everyone they had contact with for the past six months uh, on every social media platform. We like you cast out that net immediately. I agree. That's what should have been done. I agree with you. I, I've said the whole time that applications are, are going to be the determining factor here. We even did the video on the background recordings of audios being able to place you. The hum. You know, yeah, the hum. More, more of a reliable uh, location-based sound identifier than even a, a tower. You know, the, the Moscow Horrible Towers. Um but these are super interesting, and I think they could tell a lot. And I think there's a lot of in-between information here where it's not direct information being said uh, in these search warrants and requests, but it's the in-between information, like things like the date, the fact that they're looking at Ethan Chapin's TikTok. Uh, and Bethany and, and Dylan's to present, to current day. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and into Dylan's and Bethany's, like you said, uh, I think that that's interesting. I think it is very interesting. And um, if it's to present day, that's are they interesting looking for others. Like I've said, are they looking for somebody else? Are they looking for a uh, co, co conspirator? Yeah. Uh, are yep. they looking for something additional here? Are they coming to a conclusion that like, okay, maybe we went too fast. Yeah. Maybe we need to quadruple check our work. Maybe something's not adding up now like we thought it was six months ago. I, I don't know. That's what I think. I don't know. Because it's really odd to just like literally a year into the case almost. To start requesting the surviving roommate's TikToks account from months before the crime, June 1st, 2022, all the way to present day, which was August 2023. Yeah. It's really odd to do that this far into the case. Yeah. I, I'm not looking at and it Ethan's. too like they're necessarily uh, the, the suspects, but again, it could be a situation a of where exactly it is casting that or... If there is a suspect out there or another suspect out there, would they be looking at their account? Could they be like, oh, what? why is this account came to their TikTok like every day for the last three months? You know what I mean? Does this person have any relation and or contact to these individuals? Why are they here? You know? Yeah. I mean, and it's weird, you know, that. Like, are they looking for some kind of stalker anywhere? Um, because remember, they said they dug into Kaylee having a stalker and she didn't have one. Yeah. But then they come out and say, well, actually, there was a stalker and it was Brian Koberger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then now they're digging into all of this. It makes you wonder, like, are they looking for a co-defendant, like another stalker? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and just like some of the examples of stuff they're looking for is like deleted searches, search history, accounts that have friended them, accounts that have left comments, accounts that have left comments and deleted it, comments they've left and deleted it, uh, like anything. Something to remember, you guys, for anybody that's not like uh, super tech savvy, which I don't ever want anyone to feel like they should be or need to be. It's just like another profession you know there are people out there that are like phenomenal on cars can do anything to a car that's like technology there are people out there that are just attracted to it and they like doing yeah, it. yeah but, um, but but you should know the basics around safety and technology if you're going to use it like which people can you know it's it can be pretty easy to learn how to just be safe yeah but uh so don't feel bad in in that way and that's why i'm just explaining like some of the background of what exactly they're looking for and with apps like this all of these that we're talking about when you do something online uh you're essentially like pressing you're putting a handprint in the sand. You're leaving your mark there. The only thing is, is that sand never goes away, ever. It will forever be there. Uh, 
And it just depends on who has the power to see that mark. Like trace DNA. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> who has the power to see that mark? Because you might delete it and it might not say, hey, there was a message deleted here and this is what it said. But the companies who manage these platforms and own them can see that. They have so, a record of it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Things don't just go away on the internet. So I'm curious what you guys think and how you feel about it. Um, it. It's interesting. And I'm curious if you think that there's a potential they're looking at somebody else or for somebody else, uh, or this is just the standard background of information we expected them. Uh, we expected to see from police because this this is again more of what I expected to see the whole time. Is anyone close to that house? Anybody tied to that house, including the unnamed roommate that had yet to move in? There should be search warrants on everybody. There should be. There, there needs to be. be a basic search warrant just looking into their their geolocation and GPS. If their geolocation and or GPS shows that. Well, they kind of came to the house a lot. They kind of drove by here a lot. They're, you know, you're looking for identifying uh, patterns of behavior. If they have that, then that gives you the red flag to dig a little deeper. Okay, well, then let's look into the applications and see how often they were. You know what I mean? You know what my theory is? Hmm. I So remember back when we covered the first unsealed search warrants that we talked about like around this time of last year? Mm -hmm. And I said, why are they redacting the person's name off of it? Do they have a code in it? And you were like, no way. I don't think so. And you're like, they're for Brian. It's so obvious. Well, actually, I was just sitting here thinking about it. And I was like, light bulb. They are redacting Brian's name off of any search warrants now because they don't want people digging. And they think it's going to prejudice what people think in the public. Maybe, I don't know. Or it looks bad on them because it's like we're just now digging into all of this of Brian's. I think there's a I reason. I think that's more likely. I think there's a reason that every, that I think there's a reason we're not seeing any search warrants with his name on them, but we're seeing ones for the victims and ones that are redacted with no name. That makes me think all the ones with no name, for the most part, are Brian Koberger. And there's a reason behind that where they're trying to protect his right somehow or, you know, not make themselves look bad for just now looking yeah. at all this stuff. Um, there's some reason to it, I think. Or six months ago or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This yeah, is all stuff ago. that should have happened before January 1st of 2023, in my opinion. But Same. Yeah. Let me know what you guys think, and I'm curious how you feel about it. Leave the comments below, and uh, if you if you want to know more information into the tech stuff, leave a comment. I will dig deeper if you want me to. So, we are going to go over the Brian Koberger hearing that took place um, this past Friday, which was the 26th of January, 2024. Um, it happened a little after 1 p.m. Pacific time over there, and this was just the public one. Before this, um, they had a sealed hearing where they discussed the interlocutory appeal and the motion to reconsider um, the dismissal of the grand jury indictment. Well, it was interesting. Um, it was like almost an hour long Judge Judge streamed it and didn't allow it to be saved. It just deleted off the channel. Are you serious? Yeah. Whoa. I watched Get a Clue um, after. I didn't get to watch it live, unfortunately. But I watched his streaming of it after. And it just literally, it wasn't even the end of the hearing yet. And it just said, this video is private. And he couldn't even finish it. They were probably blocking certain people that were streaming it. Maybe I don't know. I don't. I don't know what happened, but there are now like East Idaho News Long Crime has the full length uploaded now. Yeah, 
So, I mean, we, you can go back and see it. Um, but I wanted to review it and discuss some of the things specifically Ann Taylor said, because I was like, whoa, that's kind of a bombshell. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, so, I want to know. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. So, because uh, of, you know, yeah. stuff. Yeah. Everything you've been through this week. So it begins with um, Jay Logston making the first argument, um, basically saying they're never going to get answers on their argument around all of this grand jury indictment dismissal, you know, their argument that they the standard of proof should have been without a reasonable doubt um, or beyond a reasonable doubt as opposed to what the current working law is, which is probable cause for a grand jury indictment. And that after trial, it never happens where you can go back to how an indictment was gotten, you know, was put through or whatever. They, you can't go backwards. You can't go back to that indictment and say there was a problem here and get an appeal on those grounds. That almost never happens. You have to look at the trial and you're worrying about the sentencing and all of these other things. So, sure. so basically, if we don't get an answer now, we're never going to get it. Okay. And um, the state responds and said, you know, it has been consistently probable cause this entire time. It is the working law. Um, and appealing this doesn't advance the litigation. It doesn't advance us with getting through the trial and getting to the end goal. Um, and that this is going to just create a circle where they're going to have to restart everything. And yeah, that's what Antiller wants. She does want to go in a circle and restart it by having a preliminary yeah. hearing. I think um, that's the obvious goal. That is her obvious yeah. goal. The, his defense team's obvious goal. Yeah. Um, and it also says that in he, the state also says that Idaho rule 13 F says that the whole proceeding is stayed like this entire, you know, thing, Brian's proceedings will be stayed until the termination of that appeal. Well, yeah. And that's what they don't want. So what I'm seeing here is the judge in the state do not want any more delays. They want to go to trial in this year of summer. The defense does not. So the judge and the state, this entire court hearing are pushing for that summer 2024 trial. And why I would love to see it. I don't think I, it's going to happen. It is. I, I don't know. I really hope it doesn't happen based off of Ann Taylor's comments. So while I would love to see it because I want answers and I want all of us to have answers, I think it is in Brian's best interest and the victim's best interest that it waits till 2025 for real, true, proper justice. I think for in the interest of justice for everyone, it needs to be 2025. Um, but anyway, we'll get into that more. So, um, it also, he also makes a statement, um, which I don't know. It's Bill Thompson's little sidekick. I don't remember his name, but he says that the families also have a constitutional right to getting a timely resolution in this case. Um, so that's another thing the state really focused on was the well, family's sure right, which is funny because the state sucks at communicating with the family and yeah. have not cared what the family have wanted this entire time. They tore down the house acting like, yes, we're going to respect the families and then tore it down anyway after telling them they wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. And with very little notice, they never give them notice on anything. So, um, they only, they seem to only care about what the Chapins want because the Chapins just agree with the prosecution on everything. Which is, I mean, so interesting. You don't actually care what anyone wants. Yeah. Um, Jay then says it's worth getting this, like getting glanced at so that it doesn't just get tucked away and forgotten. He feels like it's important. And he's like, who are we kidding? This case isn't going to go away. He's like, even if you get a conviction, it's going to be in appeals for 28 years. So it's not coming any quicker. Like this is going to last forever. 
It's going to be going on for decades. Yeah. So what is the hurry, essentially? Um, and he said, get some stuff wrong and see how long it takes then. Like, we need to do this right. Because if we do it wrong, it's going to take even longer. Yeah. Um, and then he says, uh, whether or not it makes it to trial or not is only part of what the court needs to look at, uh, particularly where the state wants to kill someone. Straight up said that in the court. Rough. Yeah. Wow. He said the state wants to kill someone. And then he sat down. And then the judge basically, he ignored that. He didn't even address it. And he said that, you know, basically probable cause in a grand jury indictment is rooted in a stab well in established law. And he's confident in his decision. Um, he doesn't feel like he did anything wrong with that decision. He said there's no difference in opinion among the state, which is one of the standards to get this argument to the Supreme Court, that there would need to be lots of issues with it like lots of people with a difference of opinion um and it's not it's just in this case um he doesn't want delays anymore he's concerned about that he said the supreme court could still take this up and overturn it but they're going to take his the district judge's um opinion into account and his rulings into account if they decide to do that or even so basically the supreme court's not going to consider it most likely if he didn't consider it. Um, he's asked what, like, what is this going to help? It's not going to advance the litigation. Um, and he denies it and is like, let's set a trial date. <laughs> so then Thompson gets up and addresses Jay Logston and says it was offensive. What he said was offensive. And um, they're just enforcing the law that their legislators put in place in cases like this with facts like this. A jury's entitled to decide not only guilt, potential um, guilt, but potential fulfillment. And they're only trying to fulfill their responsibilities under the law. He said characterizing it like that appeals to raw emotion and it has no place in this court um, and asks for it not to be allowed anymore. And you know what? The judge never addresses it one time. I mean, look, <laughs> it, it's because it's not subjective. That is actually an objective statement. You're right. That the outcome would be killing somebody. Now, clearly, at, look, I haven't seen it, which I actually think is beneficial in this video that you're watching, because uh, the only way that I would assume that it was a mic drop, like you're saying it was a mic drop, is if the tone suggested it was a mic drop. It, it would have to have been presented with a certain tone to make it sound like where they kill someone, you know, otherwise that is the end goal in a death penalty case. So. Technically, it shouldn't be offensive because that statement is true. Death penalty case, goal is to kill somebody, and that is their accountability around committing a heinous act if they're found guilty of said heinous act. So, it, in my opinion, uh, the, the subjective statement is from Thompson, but I also haven't seen it. Yeah. So what I think the judge was thinking is like, dang, Logson, that was a bit harsh, but whatever, it's true. And then he listens to Thompson and he was like, <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's like, it's whatever. Like it was true, even if it was a bit harsh, because Thompson literally is requesting that has no place in this courtroom. I don't want to see it any further. Please make sure it doesn't happen anymore. And the judge does nothing about it at yeah. all. He doesn't even mention it. I mean, it. I think that's a fair, I think that's a fair uh manage of the situation because look, it, you're asking someone not to say something that's true. That right. sounds really problematic, in my opinion. Well, I think Santa is pretty problematic. Mr. Santa. Um, okay. So he said he brings up the victims and the families again talking about they have a right to this being timely. Um, he said, you know, but this case is super serious and complicated and there needs to be a lot of effort put into doing it correctly. 
Um, and they want to move forward. They want to be productive. They want to set a trial date and they believe it should be done this summer for all those reasons we saw in the order, which is um, that the summer is the best time because the trying- university isn't in session and they need hotel rooms for witnesses and things like that that have to be in town and during the school year there's lots of events where hotels get completely booked up in moscow because it's a small town and they don't want to deal with that complicated situation of needing to get a hotel room for a witness and not being able to and interfering with school the school kids you know i wonder right and i don't know but i wonder uh since we're all of a sudden seeing the prosecution want to like hurry things up it that must be or could be due to the fact that they weren't expecting ann taylor to use her investigative team they want her to stop they want deadlines <laughs> that, yeah when the whole time they've been dragging their heels very clearly i know they've said the opposite but come on this is no they this is were a court. they were dragging their heels the, the entire time slowing everything down trying to get him to waive his speedy trial in a very manipulative way and me personally i again i i have no idea if he's innocent i have no idea if he's guilty but what i do know is that not turning over evidence and intentionally slowing down the defense from creating a proper uh defense it 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 breaches somebody's right as a person so we haven't went through ann taylor's comments yet and i know i'm saying this a little premature because we haven't gone through her comments yet but absolutely and i want to say one thing ann taylor which we're going to go through here in a second she has not received the cast report she has not received many expert reports and she keeps discovering things that she doesn't have as she digs through the discovery she's like i don't have that expert's report i don't have that report i don't have anything confirming this is true and this is what happened the state digs through the discovery exactly like the defense should be doing both of them should be doing the same thing digging through the discovery making sure everything's there and then she's being she's changed tactics clearly she's she's it's not the state's fault now that i don't have this i'm not blaming it on anyone the state is dealing with all of this too they're going through the same thing we are no i don't agree i think she's just being nice to not offend bill thompson and she's trying to be on his good side so that she can get all of those things is what i think's going on that's just my personal opinion, but it feels like they're intentionally not giving those things because it's been a year. I've said this. They the should have the cast dug report. through they, that. Well, apparently they Ooh. have a draft of it, but not the official uh, one, uh, uh. which is interesting. There isn't one. We'll see. We'll see. But she only has a draft. She doesn't have an official <laughs> cast that report. Is the and official. she said, She said also that there's tons of things that she needs about the work they did with the cell towers that she does not have. It's because they didn't do any. I've said it from the beginning that it's impossible. Everything that was said in Brett Payne's uh, exhibit is impossible. It's not possible. So it's not going to be there. It will not. And I read on here what a cast report is there are multiple steps first you have to get all the information from the cell uh companies all of it every bit of information then you have to draft everything for potentials then you have to go out there and quadruple quadrillion check your work to make sure that In real life, IRL, you have to be in Moscow with your phone, checking the cell tower strength and everything with your paperwork, making sure that what you figured out on the paper is happening in real life while taking pictures to verify proof and reconfirming it. That is a cast report. It cannot be done just through, hey, let me get what towers this phone number was connected to at this time. No, it has to be quadruple checked over and over and over in real life and tech on technology that's a good point but i also i need to i i don't understand the full picture yet so i i do feel like the prosecution was dragging their heels and not turning over discovery intentionally in the beginning to get brian to waive his speedy trial right 
But now we're seeing the tables turning where the defense is dragging their heels. And Ann Taylor's very clearly, as I'm about to tell you, she's like, I need time. I am not getting discovery I need. And I am, I do not have a time to go through all of this. And she, and it sounds, I mean, anyway. And now we see the prosecution who was dragging their heels speeding up and like, we need to have a trial immediately. Which is so, why it's so manipulative, dude. Someone's either guilty or they're not. And if you have enough evidence to prove their guilt, why do you need to manipulate and try and make it to where they can't create a proper defense like that? It doesn't make sense. Well, that's my, that's kind of what I'm wondering. So them delaying the speedy trial made it so that and could dig through all of this stuff. And now they're trying to speed it up. Why? So she can't dig through it. Yeah, but that does that mean they needed something they didn't have in the beginning and they were delaying it so that they could have something they didn't have and now their case is as strong as it's ever going to get and they're worried if she continues digging it's going to be like a house of cards and fall apart. Maybe. Like I don't I'm know. I'm just I'm just throwing but, it out there cuz I don't understand. What is the point of the prosecution delaying it and allowing her to have that time to dig but, through it? What did they need? Why did they need to delay it? The prosecution uh because they they needed the school to go through their uh spring whatever rate um what's it called where you sign up for college their uh their spring signups yeah but they went a whole year what do you mean they went a whole year i mean he waived a speedy trial in august yeah of 2023 yeah that gets through another year you think it all had to do with the school? I think that was a very big part of it. Absolutely. Look, it it's no it's no maybe, and that's not me tin hatting. Okay, police is involved in politics. That includes local politics. We looked at it in the Baltimore. We see it even in healthy police stations where our politicians come down on police and say, "Look." I am trying to get reelected. These metrics don't look good. You better tighten them up. You know what I mean? And police do that. And if we're thinking that this isn't going on in Moscow, you are seriously mistaken, dude, that Scott Green is not coming to the police and being like, look, my registration numbers are hurting. Or to I the prosecutor. A, I cannot have a madman out. And we have no idea who it is. And my most important uh, semester signups are coming up. And you guys haven't figured out who it is. That's the first year. The second year, the, the, we're still pushing to the speedy trial. And again, you're back to the next year yeah. of signups. And they can't risk there being any doubt. So they're playing by school year, dude. That's what's going on. They're playing by school year. Hmm. So anyway, moving on to what Anne said, um, that she feels like this is not going to be a six week trial. It's going to be a 12 to 15 week trial. And this is when they're talking about obviously scheduling the trial. Um, she said as an attorney, um, they need, they all, his whole team needs to be able to look at every single aspect of this case. They need to dig through every piece of discovery and meet with their client regularly. And she's like, we're doing all of that. Um, meeting with experts, hiring a mitigator, and they've already done all of that. Um, she said, you know, it takes a long time to get all of this done. Um, then she goes into the 51 terabytes. And she said, I want to explain to you exactly how much data that is. And she said that, um, Massith was looking at Dropbox, their Dropbox. And she said one terabyte holds 250,000 pics or 500 hours of HD video or 6.5 million documents. And she said, we have 51 of those. That's only one terabyte. And we have 51 of those. And she said, it's a lot. 
Another aspect. She's over exaggerating a little bit, but that's fine. All lawyers do. Yeah. Yeah. What? It's still a lot. Like no, a, a terabyte lot. is a lot. It's a lot. Um, and she said that um, the media has drawn so much atten- attention to this case that it's not ending anytime soon. Um, and that it affects the witnesses. She's like, you know, they're slamming the doors in our face. They don't want anything to do with us. Um, she said, or you have a witness who's talked way too much to the media and now we can't use them anymore. Um, and she said in the innocence phase that there's usually at least like 400 potential witnesses. She said they have a hundred left to talk to. Um, and that's all like what they have talked to is only 10% of that, of like for the 400 that's expected, it's only 10% of what they should have talked to so far. And they have a hundred left. Jeez. She was talking about like a standard number, what's standard. And then yep. saying we have a hundred left and we've only talked to like 10% of what we should have so far. Um, she said they, they also need to go through Brian's entire life story, go three generations back on his mother's and his father's side, that that's part of like the standards of what she should be doing as a lawyer in his case. Um, And she was going through, I don't remember what it's called, but it's some kind of like rules, standards, policy procedures, um, which is interesting. I didn't know they needed to go three generations back on his mother and his father's side. It's probably a death penalty thing. Yeah. Um, and then she talks about the 11th request for discovery. Um, she said that they, it includes like 250 items with subparts. She said there, you know, we're getting in all this information. She talks about like three, 13,000 photos, 9,000 tips that couldn't be gotten until that tip line was shut down. And she said, none of this stuff is indexed at all. It's just raw and jumbled up and getting thrown at us of course and um yeah of course it is right yeah i mean that's a common tactic i've said they're that. burying them in data but i want to be very clear here that this is a common tactic for civil court this is not a common tactic for death penalty uh uh a death penalty federal not federal um capital case. capital case yes capital case um, she We're said, seeing civil court tactics by the prosecution. I absolutely believe the prosecution in 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 order to control this case to go a hundred percent in the direction they want. They have done the character assassination. They'll never be able to admit it, and and I'll, I'll never have evidence of that. Be very clear about that. I will never have evidence of that. Just like every other case that has been controlled by media, you'll never get evidence of that. Okay. Well, who do you think these people are calling in, claiming to have connections, but not willing to give name, not willing to give information, and then the mainstream media runs with it? Come on, they come from somewhere. You know what I mean? True. So. Um, she said numerous times, no blame on the state. They're dealing with the same thing. They're getting the same thing. They're just relaying it to us. Um, and then she goes into a very, she uses this as an example that they have a very important video that is vital to this case, but they only have part of it that they can't get the rest. It's in fragments. And she said, we need it. It is vital for us to review the entirety of that footage. And apparently it's very long. It's like a very long piece of footage and they've only been giving fragments. That means it's a security camera or a... Uh... They, have, they don't even have an estimated date on when they will get the entirety of that video. I mean, but... My question is why? Like I'm 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 confused. I, I would need to understand the background of why. So they're saying that with the eleventh request for discovery, the prosecution themselves have this video and they have only sent pieces of it. That means that they would she have had th- to cut it. She's saying she has put no blame on the state. I'm not I, she- I'm not talking about blame. Who cares? Like and I'm, I don't mean that for what you're saying. What I'm trying to say in general is blame is pointless. It means nothing. Like tr- who's telling the truth and, and who's 
blaming that's absolutely meaningless so what is the assumption who has control of this video and and who is sending it to the defense so, so because whoever has control of it regardless of blame it's not okay. important is the one cutting this video up then so throughout her statement she mentions numerous time that they're dealing with many law enforcement agencies and that they okay. are sending it to the it's hard to get it because of all these different agencies and that they're sending it to the prosecution and then the prosecution is relaying it to them as fast as they can and she it sounds like she's blaming it on the agencies not the state that that they're waiting for it from the agencies not the prosecutor that he is giving them everything he has which is another tactic you know what though it's another tactic because he doesn't have it so he can't give it to them and he may not know about it and it's plausible yeah. deniability yeah which is what i think is going on here or or it's like i've said from the from the beginning um and it's probably a story that we need to do again is talking about how prosecutors handle and or manage um, when they they've realized that they're covering a case that involves corruption or some kinds of uh, some kind of police fraud. Look, I'm all for giving people the benefit of the doubt. I am 100%. All right. Um, so it did Ann Taylor meet with Bill Thompson and Bill Thompson could have been like, look, I'm going to be clear with you what I think is going on here between me and you, you know, um, and uh, I'm worried about my career. I'm worried that, uh, how the image is going to cast on me, whatever, whatever. You, I mean, we don't know these things. You know, lawyers talk. They talk. And that's OK as long as they're not like sharing jeopardizing the information case. or jeopardizing the case. But Bill, Bill Thompson could totally go to Ann Taylor and say, look, I. I don't want my career to look bad because everyone's attacking Bill Thompson. We've even brought up questions around him. You know what I mean? Um, so is it a situation where there's something funky going on and Bill Thompson is like, you know, putting up his walls to protect himself because there's Maybe. something funky going on. Maybe that's why she started saying no blame on the state. Like Could she kept, be. she kept saying that and talking about the, all the agencies they have to get this stuff from of course um, which is interesting uh, that they only were given parts of a, vi a full-length video and it's vital that it's so important i saw some people speculating it was the linda lane footage that i don't think that's and it it's not the linda no lane footage. i Come do on. not think that's it it's not the linda um, lane footage no way Dude, people no way is it the Linda from Lane the beginning footage. people have been so obsessed with the Linda Lane footage you guys and look we aren't the end all be all but have you ever seen us cover the Linda Lane footage no not once there's nothing there no, nothing there is nothing there is in the whole footage there is nothing well you know that Jesse Weber just covered the Linda Lane footage <laughs> yeah we talked about it last week a little bit about him talking about all oh, the speculation and you hear a thud not taking into account or explaining to people do you understand how many apartments are around that how many cars are around how that? many that dogs could be, that could be like neighbors next door you know bumping like doing their thing it could be anything dude it could anything it could be anything and um you know get a clue excellent actually brought up recently that the Gonzalez family, which I had never seen this, said that Murphy was not a dog that barked. He wasn't a barking dog, which I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means he didn't have the capability capability to bark, like something was wrong with him, or if that means that it took a lot to get him to bark. Like mm. he just didn't bark very often. So, I mean, which is super interesting considering everyone's constantly listening for a dog bark. There's probably tons of dogs in that area. Yeah. Um, but then she brings up the alibi, alibi that because of all these issues and not being able to interview witnesses and everything, that they haven't been able to complete their like alibi. They haven't been able to finish it and that they need a new date on it um, and that the state can't say that their time is expired. 
um, that she she what says. What was the response to that? Did Bill say anything? No. Oh, dude, I'm telling you, there's something there. Bill's putting up safety barriers if he didn't come at her for that. Well, <laughs> I don't have notes on what Bill said, so I'm going off on memory. But I'll hold on. We'll get to that in a second. So she says, in fear, in fear, I will tell you. I could be ready by summer 2025, but I'm saying that being afraid that I'm not going to be ready. And, um, she said, because that's in a perfect world. She's like, if you can get me the discovery deadlines and I can get all this stuff. So I have the time to go through all of it because Brian is our number one priority. He is our, his case is our priority. All of us are constantly working on this every single day, all of us. And we're, we are willing to do that. And we want to continue doing that. And he has the right to effective counsel in it. We are supposed to dig through every inch of this case, every inch of the discovery. And that's his right. Um, you know, and I thought that statement was wonderful. Um, but he said, this is the big bombshell for me. She said they need to have a clear picture of the how of the path of how the state got to Brian Koberger. Oh. She said I've read that PCA over and over and over. She said I know the different pieces, but I don't know how they fit together. And she said the more work I do, the less I know about and how they fit together. I said that from the beginning. I was like, I feel like I'm hearing myself right now. Yeah. And I feel like I'm hearing what you guys say. Th that is reverberating throughout the true crime community is the more I look into this, the less it makes sense. We all feel that way. And to know that Ann Taylor, who is digging through every inch of this case, feels that way. Whoa. Yeah. How did they get? There. She has way more information than we have, you guys. Like, she is I mean, digging through that it, discovery. Does she? Does yes. she? Because I'll tell you. So, that discovery, I've said it from the beginning. That discovery does not... I, look, I can, I, I'm can. i just guesstimating here. But I, I'm guesstimating over 90% of that 51 terabytes doesn't have anything to do with Brian Cooper. Over 51%. I'm, <laughs> over 90% <laughs> of that 51 terabytes doesn't have anything to do with brian Cobert. i bet you're right so uh, uh, the reason why she highlights the pca there is because of the statements we've made multiple times over and over and over so you can essentially uh minimize this case down to a few elements right those few elements are the the time of the crime or time of death um uh, that is the cell phone information backing the location of him being there during that time and times leading up to it to prove, you know, stocking, whatever. Um, it is the uh, car, the supposed car, um, and it is the uh, route of travel. That's essentially, or the, uh, the DNA. That's what I was missing. That's essentially the major evidence they have there and and everything else you know you've got to be able to prove this so i think what she's talking about when she mentions the pca is that she's taking these major pieces that are connecting him as the key suspect in this and verifying every single piece of this from you know the start of it backwards right so if you're talking about the car footage okay fine let's start pulling every video camera let's start talking to people locally let's start getting any witnesses of where that car was at what times because maybe brian wasn't paying attention if he's innocent and was just aimlessly driving has no concept of time no concept of wherever he was that that could be me someone like me if i was out driving i don't know if i'd be able to tell you exactly where it went if i was just driving aimlessly you know um, but, uh, you would have to pull all that from the PCA, you know? Yeah. It's interesting that it's super, super interesting. Um, and it makes me nervous, um, for the case because I, we've all, we've said it a million times. We're not trying to prove Brian's innocent. If anything, we want him to be guilty because the implications of him not being guilty are terrifying. Um, but uh, then Bill responds. Okay. And he's like, 
everything she said is true. She is absolutely right that this is a complicated case that we're not getting the discovery in time. Like, you know, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot, you know, and that he, you know, basically wants them to be afforded the opportunity to like bring these things up and, you know, everything. Um, he didn't really argue against her. No way. I'm telling you. Dude, he was super. Up the safety walls. He was super nice. He's putting up the safety walls. Something's up. They Something's were. Something's wrong. Anne and Bill were way too nice to each other. Logston was the one who was not nice. But I don't even think he was trying to not be nice. I think Bill just got offended by that comment. Yeah, he was and grandstanding. I, that's what it yeah. was. It sounds like is it was just grandstanding. You know, trying to trying to land an emotional point to prove an argument that you're giving. But yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Um, but he didn't. He like really didn't argue anything at all. Like that's why I don't even have notes on it because I'm like, he just agreed with her. That's all he did. He was just nice. Um, and the judge basically says that he doesn't want any more delay. Um, he, he has to think about it. He said, I got to think about this. I can't make a ruling on the scheduling, he, but he doesn't want it to go to 2025. So, I mean, oh gosh, that's gonna, that's a problem. Uh, I mean, look, judge judge has the right to make the ruling. It is 100% in his ball court, but he is his single, ball court and it, the ball is in his court. Um, his, uh, if he, if he makes the ruling for 2024, he is going to have so much hate, bro, because it look, if an attorney, which an attorney has to act in good faith is telling you that because we're going full trial and I do not have the time to offer proper counsel. If you put it in 2024, I mean, his ruling and saying that it's going to come in 2024 is essentially saying, I don't care about you as a citizen. Yeah. I don't care about your right to effective counsel. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's a, that's a big decision for judge judge to make. Because it's going to be on his shoulders, what? like all of it, not Bill Thompson. Bill Thompson literally said, here, judge, take all accountability. Yeah. It's on you. Yeah, he did. Good luck, bro. He just said, if we're going to wait until 2025, we still ask it to be in the summertime because of the school and getting hotels for witnesses. Mm -hmm. That's all he asked. I found that interesting um, because, you know, Nancy Grace has said one thing and one thing only <laughs> that I found super, super, super true. And that was that all that prosecutors and defense attorneys know is that if the other side wants it, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> and it is a bit weird. Everybody's been pointing out like they agree on a lot of weird things. Why are they agreeing on those? Like the house being torn down. Yeah, I, because I don't think the house being torn down would add any worth to either side. I really don't. I don't think it matters. I think Anne is trying to prove that Brian Koberger was never there, so the house doesn't add any worth to her. I, I understand that, why the defense doesn't want it there. I think that the prosecution gathered everything they can and simultaneously has a major issue with the, the case. And look, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you think he's guilty or innocent. There is not a single person out there that can say there's not problems here. Uh, when you read that PCA after understanding how gathering all that evidence works, right? You look, look at one piece, look at the cell phone evidence. All right. D do a deep dive into that and then come back to me. Like there's problems here. Um, and that house being torn down helps save the case from seeing any more problems, you know? Yeah. So. But I, w that's basically it. Um, I wanted to go over all of it because I felt like there was some definite mic drops and bombshells in there. Like, it's funny because every little thing that like is actually relevant feels like such a big deal because we're given nothing. 
We're not given any new information. Um, but I feel like she confirmed a lot, though, that we see as the public and aren't allowed to see. She confirmed in that statement. Mm hmm. So, um, I felt like it was interesting. Um, I don't know how I feel about the judge denying the appeal. I feel a lot of people I've noticed feel like it was pointless. I think that Ann Taylor should have argued the grand jury indictment in this case was improper or something. I don't know how it works. I'm not a lawyer, but I feel like she try should have argued that grand juries are like unconstitutional. I don't know because I feel like grand juries are wrong. They are wrong. They're so wrong. They're yeah. so wrong. I feel like there could have been a better way to argue it, to try to get grand juries nullified. But, and you know, I keep seeing people say, well, that would mean they have to go back to every other case and change it with the probable cause thing though. And I'm thinking they don't have to do that. They can have a special working order saying any previous case isn't affected by this. Yeah. Yeah. Only here, you know, here for from now, it is affected, you know, at the start of this law being put in place or this case or whatever. Like they can have special things that they add. I just, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't feel like that their argument is going anywhere with what the public is saying. Now, we don't know what they're arguing in the closed hearings. I wish we knew that. You know? Mm -hmm. I really wish we knew it was in the closed hearings because then maybe it would change a lot of minds. But we don't. But let me know what you guys think. Um, again, I don't know how I feel about the appeal or the judge's decision. I just don't know. That's something I'm going to have to think about. And then maybe we can talk about it in a live but I definitely want to hear your opinions, uh, what you thought about this hearing, um, if you felt like I did and that there were mic drops in here. But yeah. Right. Um, now, I did want to mention real quick that the Gonzalez family really wanted a date for the trial yeah. in an interview. And I'm going to be talking about their... Um, for my next case, their interview on Good Morning America and some of the information they dropped. So just stay tuned. And I'm going to talk about that here in a minute. Yeah. All right. So getting into my second topic, which this topic is another Idaho four topic. So we're just going to continue right along here. We have got to dive back into the peeping video thumb that you will see here um, that talked about some of the background behavioral uh, identifier of past serial killers and looking into the potential of Brian Koberger uh, having some of those. Now, why I brought this up again <clears throat> is we probably had 50 comments on that video talking about this one situation, right? So I, I thought, look, we're going to be a reflection of the community and talk about topics that the community finds interesting. All right. So we're going to dig into this and we're going to, we're going to think it out. We're going to think it through. We're going to thought write it out. So um, I also want to bring up a comment that someone else left um, because they believe that there's some identifiers there. And I, I don't think uh, it's interesting reading comments that have so much like random information in it to where it could very easily be proved not possible, you know, within this. And I think these, these topics are really interesting when you're looking at it. All right. So the one I'm talking about is the uh, Brian Koberger, had a female a female neighbor she thought somebody broke in and moved some things around okay he she reached out to him he installed cameras and it was to spy on her yeah because i brought that up in the video yeah we didn't we barely touched on it though yeah um so a ton of people talking 
about this and saying, this is that evidence. This is evolution evolving behavior. This is escalating behavior. Yeah, but and he didn't attack her. Wait, what's interesting is I found when I'm researching into this that they had a police chief and investigator come on to talk about this mainstream media did. So I, as I'm looking back at some of these, uh, some of these topics, it's now making sense why so many people believe these things. Right. So my first, uh, my first order of things here was to start, start searching the web all over the gray web, every, uh, search engine I could, um, and reading everything. There is zero evidence without me putting my technological expertise on it. There is zero evidence of this being real. Essentially what I'm seeing when I'm looking through all of it, and I probably clicked on 200, 300 different links talking directly about this. Every link is just talking about this topic without a single piece of evidence. And just like an example of that, okay, if we're going to look at this thing objectively, uh, Daily Mail, um, Idaho quadruple murder suspect Brian Koberger broke into apartment of female colleague, then installed security cameras to spy on her when she asked for help months before brutal killings. And here's what's interesting. There is not one single piece of objective evidence in this entire thing with that salacious title they don't say where the rumor comes no, from no nothing so i continued looking because my first question is dude it had to be the girl then that made this assumption right and just wait i'll go into the technical side of things at the end I couldn't find a single link talking about her stating that not one of them, not one of them say she came forward and said this, not one. Therefore leading me to wonder who came forward and said this. And I, I came to a conclusion here that another reason why I chose this one is okay. This from everything that I've researched, this is the, the best that I can come up with. Okay. Is this situation happened? It just didn't happen in the way it's being suggested. So he has a, uh, a female colleague. She believes her house got broken into nothing's missing. Things are moved. Okay. Which I would feel super weird about that. That's something that um, Manson did, right? They called it the creepy crawl, I think. And they would go into houses and quietly Creepy move, crawling. Yep. Quietly move things around and then leave without taking anything. Yep. So people wake up like, what? You know? Um, so she believes she was broken into. She called the police and and reported it. All right. So there is an official report of a break in potentially in this area, according to all of these stories. That is the most objective fact I could find is that a break in happened and it was reported. The next thing is uh, a it, it says in multiple of these that she did say Brian helped her install cameras and they do say she said this, that Brian helped her install cameras. Um, but what's interesting is not a single one of them, and please call me on it, you guys. If I'm wrong, show me somewhere I'm wrong. Like, where's some evidence with this? Nowhere, not one place does it say, she said Brian was spying on him. On her. Yeah. On her, yeah. The only thing I can find is that uh, Latah County was looking into Brian as a break-in suspect. So where all that filler came from, I, I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. Isn't that weird? Yeah. It's so strange. Well, you know, 
I think there is a leak um, who's violating the gag order. So uh, it makes me wonder. Did, is it violating if it's a lie? No, I don't right. think so. It's unless, not. unless it is proven to be like a prosecutor, somebody directly involved in the case who's going around spreading lies like that, then yeah, I believe it would be Which, some kind of violation of the gag order and they could be in big trouble. To be clear, that's not new, you guys. This goes on all the time. Trial by media is very real and they are tactics that are used by attorneys all the time. Yeah. It just is what it is. So, yeah. So, I mean... I Apparently, before there was ever even the public hearing going on on Friday, um, News Nation was already reporting that the judge denied the motion before it ever happened in the public sphere. Yeah, I saw that. I actually saw that. Yep. So, so there is some kind of leak because that's supposed to be sealed to the public. Yeah. There's no media in there. There's no family in there. There's nobody I mean, except you for- You know what's interesting? You know that- we got a comment personally uh, 24 full hours before that saying he denied the motion. No way. Yep. I just chose to ignore it, but you know, I probably shouldn't have said it up. I'll, I'll probably delete it, but yeah. Yep. So I do believe there's some kind of leak. Yeah. And, and I don't, we it don't wasn't know a user account. It was like an unnamed account. Oh gosh. Yeah. So, and I've wondered this whole time, remember, I was like, is somebody going around to people's channels and is leaking information, is commenting things, even if they're lies, they could be real, they could be lies. Sometimes we don't, we won't have any idea yeah. and, and trying to guide the focus in certain directions. It's I alleged I that a it. long time ago or not a long time ago. It was like probably like a month or two ago. Uh, but I was, I've been feeling that way for a while and I think it's a possibility. Well, uh, yeah, of course. Absolutely. Well, that goes back to what I'm saying. Trial by media is a very real thing, you guys. And a, a, there are a lot of people out there, uh, people in general that will use every tool at their disposal, Yes, especially if they're not going to get caught. Okay. Now, Many people have responded to that comment that I'm making right now. I am not trying to suggest the prosecution is doing some absurd, illegal, horrible thing. Is it illegal? Yes. Can it ever be proven? Absolutely not. So I'm not trying to play a gotcha comment on the prosecution. We know attorneys do this. We know they do. It is more commonly seen in civil cases, especially really high priority civil cases. It's not so common in death penalty uh, capital cases, but I, if an attorney does it, then any attorney could do it. And that's just the way I look at it. And I'm not trying to point blame. I'm not trying to say hundred percent, this is what they're doing. But it's a very real possibility, and it, it it's coming from somewhere, right? Could it could it also not be the prosecution? Could it also be the police officers who maybe made a mistake along this investigation and now have some kind of buy in in or in Brian being found guilty? Absolutely. Uh, as long as they aren't the ones calling in and making the tip, does it violate the gag? Nope, it doesn't. As long as they're not sharing information vital to the investigation. Um, so there are also ways to have trial by media without breaking that gag order too. Hmm. So, but going back to the situation, we talked about these behaviors, right? And we want to be objective. And now being objective does not mean we have every single piece of factual background information ever possible. I'm sure every single person watching this video right now has done something in your life that could be seen as a red flag. Yep. Everybody. Yeah. Okay. We all make mistakes. We all do things that we look back and we're like, why? Like, what was going on? You Absolutely. Know what I mean? I'm sure somebody could paint me to be a serial killer pretty easy based on my past mistakes. Yeah. Um, that's why I don't feel like any of Brian's red flags are that much of a red flag. Like the addiction, stealing his sister's phone, um, you know, yeah. possibly having a bad situation with a girl and tickling. Like they're, they're not enough. That's why I'm looking for these particular markers that we've seen 
historically repeat and killers. Yeah. And, and I'm or, not seeing them. Or the power control situation. Yes. The tickling, that is not a, 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 a control of power type situation. The addiction, that's a loss of control. Normally what comes with it are behaviors of where you're trying to establish fake control to feel like your life's in control because it's not. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, all we saw is one bout of theft that his dad held him accountable which applause to him you know um yeah, yeah and I, he got went to rehab and got sober I, like i know i know um so again this video i've said it on the two conversations we've already talked about this but we're not here trying to prove brian koberger is innocent we're not here trying to prove brian koberger is guilty uh you know that that would be like handing somebody 10 percent of a puzzle pieces and saying you know tell me tell me what it is tell me what it is i i don't know i can't tell you i don't have enough you know um but uh we're we're looking into the investigation we're not well, trying like to it. identify his guilt or innocence we are trying to identify the investigation well that's like giving somebody an answer key with no test right there's absolutely. no point. Yeah. Like absolutely. just jumping to he's innocent or guilty. Guys, we haven't even taken the test. Like we haven't even gone through the trial. We haven't even seen all of the investigation and the evidence. There's no way to make a determination right now. You can think one way or the other that you lean one way or the other. And I understand that. And I, yeah. everyone's opinions are valid, but are not necessarily true. And we can't know what's true until we have all of the evidence. And even then we may not actually know what's true. My number one statement, what I can commit here is that there is a problem in the investigation. Agreed. 100%. And the reason for that is because I have a pretty extensive expertise in wireless and what they're saying isn't possible. If it was worded a different way, if it was explained a different way, it is possible to uh, get a, a geolocation, uh, but not in the way they're claiming. So what is on the PCA is simply impossible. It doesn't matter what somebody believes they're an expert of out there. It is not possible to triangulate in that location. Um, so yeah, going back to this though. Now, somebody left a comment here, okay? And this is where we're going to dig into like the technology parts. And I do want to highlight this comment um, just because I think it's important for people to understand how, like we say this all the time, listen to us, don't believe us. Take the information as a carrot and verify the information. Who knows what we could be wrong in? You know, I, I this we're looking at things scientifically, objectively, where science is wrong 99% of the time and right 1%, if that, you know. Uh, but this person says that Brian Koberger has a, a proven history of breaking into houses and stalking where two women actually got uh, protection orders out on him. All right. I looked everywhere. That is public record. That is public record. And that would not all of a sudden be sealed because he got arrested here. That's not how those things work. Protective orders are public orders set in place and can be verified. Uh, so they're just like not. him being pulled over. That wasn't sealed Correct. like the body cam. They won't release, but we still have public record of him being pulled over all those times. Correct. And, yeah. uh, so he, uh, it, there is no protective order unless for some reason it's, I, I don't know. I can't even think of a reason. And, and this is my evidence of that is, uh, he was applying to be part of a police department. Yeah. Do you really think that he would apply to be part of the police with two open protective orders and evidence of stalking? Really? Police departments do thorough background checks. They also do lie detector tests at most of them. Well, before. and it said he was passing like an FBI level background check. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So that's just not possible okay so i just wanted to cl clear that up because i didn't take that comment down but it's interesting where if somebody's leaving that comment here then they're leaving it in other places and that is very easily 
uh, objectively proven untrue, right? Very easily. Um, so, and anyone can do it. Um, so going into the cameras, it says that she had someone break in to her house or she believes that that's an important thing. She believes it. nothing's missing. Things are moved around. Okay. Um, clearly she called the police and made a report because there is a report out there because it does say here confidently that, uh, they were looking into him potentially being the person that could have been breaking into these places. Um, but no additional charges have come. Uh, nothing additional has come. And, uh, they said that she reached out to him for help to get to the security camera. So for anybody that doesn't know how a security camera works is it usually has its own application with it. Yeah. All right. In order to have access to that application, you need an invite. There is a, uh, there's an owner account and there's usually only one of those. And then that owner account will send requests and or invites to other devices um, or emails or whatever to have access to that. Now, could someone theoretically put up security cameras and uh, put a parent account and then give their phone access to it. They can, but most of them alert you when people are using that. Most of them alert you when stuff has been looked at or it has been taken off as not a new video file anymore or whatever, right? Like so, once you've watched it, it says this person's watched it. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it also, you'll see, like you can see everyone in their email address or whatever, their Absolutely. phone type that has access Absolutely. to your security cameras. And here's another thing. This is what it says in most of these, that this is, this is likely how Brian was stalking her because he probably got access to her Wi-Fi e uh, password. Okay. Even if he had access to her Wi-Fi password, that doesn't give him access to the application for the security cameras, which is a separate application altogether. You couldn't just get in that from the Wi-Fi password. That's not possible. You still have to be added. You can't hack Wi-Fi cameras using Wi-Fi? No. No. Hmm. Nope. These cameras uh, are 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 corporatized, and they are not just accessible to be used on any open network. That's not how they work. Ring cameras are ring. Uh, Arlo are Arlo. Um, that other MHCI is MHCI. Like they're they're connected to these applications specifically. Hmm. It's not something that you could do very easily, very easily. I'm sure you could do it, but not very easily. You'd probably have to take the cameras apart, um, you know, open up the network capability to be able to be picked up by a phone, which then it wouldn't be usable by her. Oh. So um, here's another thing is... I started thinking about this and I'm thinking, wait, how does that make sense? So she thought she was broken into, asked Brian to help and install security cameras. And he came in and was like, yo, we need to install one in your bathroom, in your bedroom, in your kitchen, in your living room. And like, you'll be set. You install cameras outside. How does that spy on someone? You really like to look when she's walking, like, in the front door? I mean, it would let you know when she's coming and going if you're planning on arriving there at a certain time. Not like, really. It would tell you her routines of when she leaves, when she comes home, when she's home, if you want to go attack her. But he didn't attack her. He attacked people in another town? If he's the one, yeah. 
Which yeah. doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Like to if me. you got your sights set on this one girl, why didn't you harm this one girl instead of going uh, to another town and hurting five or four people? Yeah. And also this story, like it, it's always written in a way that suggests like Brian's this uh, evil techie genius dude. And she was like helpless to that when more than likely she probably didn't know how to like install the camera nothing in here suggests like screwing it in the yeah, wall yeah no nothing in here suggests that she didn't understand technology right you know what i mean like how to up download an app and sign up like a normal account and how just to download pay for it how to look at where your logins are and located where you know what i mean this whole thing just drives me nuts. But this was said a lot. Like a lot of people commented on our videos and this was the number one thing they're talking about. So I wanted to be able to look into literally everything I could find. And this is what I came up with. Could it be true? Sure, I guess. But the problem is, is there is zero evidence. <laughs> There's only evidence of a break-in and her saying Brian helped her uh, install security cameras yeah supposedly Everything says though. that he installed security cameras to spy on her that's what it says in everything yeah but there's no objective evidence there's no proof at all there is no evidence none there is zero that's Nothing. what i was all just it saying. says is there were some break-ins in this area uh wait multiple break-ins yep and uh that yeah, but there's always multiple break-ins, especially in a college town. Um, and then it says that Lata was looking at Brian Koberger to see if he was the suspect for these break-ins. That's it. That's it. That's the whole thing. That's all of the evidence. That is everything. It doesn't name her, meaning she never made a statement about him being the one. Um, hmm. Yeah, right? Isn't that strange? Well, yeah, I already knew there was no proof to those claims. Um, but yeah, that's interesting. I wonder where it came from. I mean, probably the ex-FBI profiler, Greg Cooper, who claims that the incident was 100% uh, Brian Koberger's step in the progression. Wow. Yeah. Very nice. So, you guys, uh, if I'm missing something here, uh, you know, please feel free to reach out and let me know. Leave a comment. Help me understand it further. Because from my understanding here, it, it's not possible to get security cameras, put them up, and then have like unfettered access without the owner of those security cameras knowing it. I know there's all this stuff in movies where like it shows people tapping right into security, but uh, those are normally closed network security cameras where they can be accessed through hard lines. Like they have actual wires connected to them running to uh, a box, like a data router uh, and, and then pulled up like it, it's a, it's a hard line source. You know what I mean? Hmm. When cameras you buy at the store, are not that they aren't that anymore. So yeah. Interesting. But let me know what you guys think. We got an interview dropped the morning before the hearing started this past Friday. Um, the hearing involving Brian Koberger and his defense's motion to reconsider the, you know, grand jury dis dismissal of the indictment that the judge ruled against and um, the motion to appeal the interlocutory appeal thing. So we just went over all of that, the hearing. Um, and now we're going to talk about this interview because they were really, you know, the Gonzalez family, they shared never, be never before, in pi never before seen pictures and videos of Kaylee, uh, which was kind of nice. Um, you know, seeing some of those, um, and they kind of talked about their, there's more in the article than there is in the actual video, because in the video, they, it's really just the interviewer talking for them. Like, 
you know, after the interview when she's actually on the air um, and showing very short clips of actually Steve and Christy talking. Um, but from the interview, the information we got was the family essentially feeling like they're in limbo, that they're planning their whole life around this trial without even a date in place. Um, and I'm sure that's super crappy. Just like feeling like you can't do anything. You can't move or take a new job or do anything because you need to be here for this trial. Um, but you know, he, they also mention like the speculation and conspiracy theories that are thriving right now, uh, with the gag order and how all of this is being handled. Um, and they say they really want that trial date. Like they really, yeah. ho they really hoped the trial date would be given, which even if the judge had given a trial date, which he did not, he said he needed to think on it. Um, there's no guarantee it would happen by then. They could run into something where they delay it again, you know? I know. Um, but I understand their want for that and their want to like conclude all of this. Um, and get justice for their daughter and, you know, move on because this is prolonging grief, you know, and once the trial actually happens, they're probably going to see things they don't want to see and hear things they don't want to hear that are going to, or better yet said that are going to re traumatize, bring that grief back up. Um, but they, they brought up the way Kaylee was found. So a while back, remember, they came out and said that she was trapped between the wall and Maddie. And then there was all this speculation and ideas going around that Maddie was the intended target because she was attacked first. Mm. Because Kaylee was trapped between her and the wall. And that was coming right from the Gonzalez's who said that they were told this by Kathy Mabbitt. Well, they get, gave a very tiny extra piece in this adding on to that. And this is what they said. They said um, there was an indication that their daughter fought for her life. The way the bedroom was set up is if someone came in, you cannot get out. Uh, you're completely, totally trapped, Christy said. The bed was the entire room. You couldn't barely open the door without swiping the foot of the bed. Um, and they go on to say that she was found sitting up against the wall. Mm. She was sitting up and slumped over. Which is something we didn't know before. We were told that these kids were asleep. That all of them were asleep. Yep. So it's a bit odd. So how much did she fight? Like, was she asleep and woke up to Maddie and got up? Yeah. Was she or awake? Already? Was she awake? Because we also know that Dylan said she heard somebody say who she thought was Kaylee, somebody's here. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting to me that the whole idea is to make the timeline fit, they had to be asleep. Because if you have multiple victims fighting back, that's going to make it take longer. Yeah. And that's going to put the timeline into question. Maybe. Maybe. They're I saying he think, got in and out in like nine minutes. Yeah, I know. I, I still think a lot can happen even with somebody fighting back in nine minutes. Uh, I yeah, truly do. You're and, right. and I've thought that from the beginning. But where it becomes a question is not the actual hand-to-hand -hand encounter of the people. I think if you totaled up, the damage that was done with four people and you like started from the time of each interaction with each person, I would not be surprised to hear. Uh, so 20, 40, I wouldn't be surprised to hear that a minute and 30 seconds 
everything could be done in that time. Where I start having doubt is being able to get around the house with no evidence of ever being there prior, you know, uh, unless there is, and we don't know about it yet, uh, doing it with no DNA and controlling the crime scene. The first thing I think about when you said she's found in the corner is, okay, did the uh, horrible crime happen first and she wasn't gone and then she pulled herself up into the yep, corner? Yeah, I thought or, about that too. Which I doubt, man, with the, with the ex extent of these wounds... You're talking seconds well, they, before enough blood comes out that you lose consciousness. They said she got the worst of it, too. Right. Or two, um, someone would have to crawl on, someone would have to be on the bed yeah. to get to her in the corner. Yeah. So, how is there no evidence? Well, like an abundance so, I'm talking about because that requires somebody like leaning with other additional, you know, BLOD. Uh, and uh, that a lot has to go on a lot of body contact with a bed and a person and reaching. And like, you know what I mean? You're right. Now, it is a, I think, a twin size, right? Or was it not? No, both of those mattresses were queens yeah. that we saw pulled out of the house. It wasn't a twin. Yeah, you're right. I remember. Yep. They were both queens. Mm -hmm. It was in the rendition, the digital rendition that they looked like twins and yep. they weren't. It yep. was a queen. Yeah, you're right. And so, with how little that room was, she's absolutely right. It would have filled the whole room. Yeah. That yep. queen size bed. And to th if their heads, like what we saw in the rendition, the remakes, the digital remakes, if their feet were towards the door and heads towards that back wall, you, you absolutely have to crawl on the bed to get to oh, Kaylee. Absolutely. That, that's why I'm or wondering. Or she if... has to come to you. Mm -hmm. She has to be out of bed or not. Like, so being all the way back up against in the corner, like slumped over. Now, I guess that could explain the knife sheath and the tussle getting, but there's no way somebody could rip that off. It's no. leather. Yeah, yeah. So it he wouldn't. would have to not have it not attached to a belt or anything. It would have to just be in his hand. Yeah, yeah. If right. that is truly the knife sheath that is part of this crime that went the to the weapon, weapon. Yep. that went to the weapon that committed the crime. So... It brings me a lot more questions, um, like a lot more questions, because it doesn't really seem to make sense with what we've been told so far. And I agree with you. When you have victims who are fighting back, that leaves like so much more, especially with the type of wounds we're talking about. And we're talking about blood splatter and arterial spray. That means he had to be covered in blood. Exactly. Doing that on a bed like that. He had to be. Exactly. So, so the no blood trail, like, cause I heard a lot of people argue, well, if you're leaning over and doing it and your feet are on the floor and that's all on the bed, that can make sense how you wouldn't have a blood trail. Well, if they're fighting back and the whole bed is a room and she's trapped up against the wall and everything, you have to lean over pretty far. Like you have to be, you know what I mean? Like you're going to be really in contact with all that. A knife is very up close and personal. So I just don't think there's a way for there not to be a blood trail at all. There has to be. And again, yeah, Santa was on the floor at the foot of the bed, like away from Ethan. She fought too. So yeah. therefore, for there to be no blood trail, for there to be nothing, it's no strange. blood in his car that he drove to the crime scene. It's very strange. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. I know. Unless they're hiding all of that for some reason. Yeah.
Yeah, I know. I know. I'm sitting here just trying to think of, you know, how it could have happened. Uh, and it, it does not make It doesn't sense. seem possible. I mean, because look, I'm thinking points of contact. If you need to reach over to get at somebody because they're in the corner of the bed, you have to put your hand down, okay? And that puts pressure. And with that amount of, you know, bodily liquid fluid stuff uh, on the bed, it would come to your hands. It would, you know, maybe go towards your waist when you're leaning onto it. I mean, I, there's, there's too many points of contact there. It's very strange to then manage that and control that uh, to leave no trails. Yeah. It's very strange. I'm curious how high the bed was too. Like, are we talking a bed on the floor? Are we talking a bed on a high platform or like a, just a normal basic one? Like, what are we talking with the height of the bed? Cause that will matter too. I think, um, a lot. Um, but I don't know. What do you, what do you think about that? Do you have anything to add? with that finding with them saying she was sitting up? I, I don't, I think we've pretty much said everything. I mean, the one thing that I would say is I just, I hope for their sake, the Gonsalves' sake, uh, because we're seeing their, we're seeing their trauma and, uh, recovery from this horrible situation uh, unfold in front of our eyes that I, I hope for their sake that the police have the right guy because man, just imagine being them and believing like progress is being made. Uh, we know who it could be. And then something comes up that proves Brian Koberger legitimately is not the one. Can you imagine being in their shoes? Oh no, man. I terrible. would freak out. That would be awful, you know, and I feel really bad for them. You know, there's a lot of people out there in the Internet uh, that are comfortable giving Steve a hard time because he's spoken out so much and the way he presents himself and stuff like that. And let's be real, like there are people out there that will rub other people wrong. That's just part of being a human. Yeah. That's just how things work. For sure. Um, but it, it doesn't take away from the fact that he is a victim in this situation and uh, he is living his, uh, what's it called when you're, I'm having an ADHD moment for uh getting over the the loss um grief yeah he he is living his grief in front of a camera most of the time uh yep. so to have something like that happen where essentially everything you thought you knew comes out not to be true it would probably be devastating man yep it would be um it would be hard especially with how much um I mean, Steve has said he's still open, but it seems like they're pretty set on it being Brian. Um, but they don't have much more information than us. They they claim. Um, I'm so just, I I am very surprised that they are so confident it's him. I am too. Um, I am too. But you know, it could. There's a lot of emotions in play there, which can, you know, skew the way they're looking at it. Uh, they talk about the house being demolished after that, um, and how like Christy, and this is in the article, not in the actual video, that Christy um, was notified in her email the house was being demolished, um, and she lost it. And she said on the morning that it happened, she was waiting for a Hail, Hail Mary and was in denial and turned on the TV. And literally as she turned it on, they were taking a swipe at Kaylee's room. And uh, it was it was hard. She said it was horrible. Yeah. You know, they were they were. I I still kind of can't believe they tore down the house. Yeah, there's a little bit of hope gone right there. Uh, yeah. Because if. Uh, if Brian Koberger 
is not the guy um, that you just took away the crime scene and you took away the ability to go back and potentially look for errors. You just took away the ability for um, a private detective, which it, I don't know if you guys know your stats around like private detectives, but private detectives close rates are a lot of times double the success rate of an investigator probably because investigators are always working more than one case normally. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they use different methods uh, and things like that. But you just took away that ability for a private investigator uh, to be able to come in there and look at it firsthand. If something ever ended up not panning out, something goes wrong. Um, I, yeah, it just blows me away a little bit because I feel like I'm watching this police department make decisions without having a planned backup. When in my opinion and my line of work in corporate America, like the plan, the backup plan is literally just as important as the plan. You yeah, can't but have was, one without the other. You need a plan and you need to commit to it and believe that it's the right one. But you need a backup plan just in case you're wrong. Agreed. But it was it was the it was the um, president of the university that really wanted it tore down. And you know, I Bill Thompson was like, okay, and and yeah, Taylor was it. too. Which I understand. Like I've said from the beginning, it makes sense why the defense doesn't care, but it doesn't make sense why the prosecution doesn't care and. You know, like the other people who should care don't, it, which is weird. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, she said it's, I don't know, it's, it's really more subjective emotional things after that. Like, you know, there never really is any justice because him dying doesn't bring her back. And, you know. Yeah, that's not the definition of justice, but I understand feeling like that because, yeah. yes, again, that is uh, part of grief recovery right there is realizing that, uh, you know, she, she's not just lost, but unfortunately, it's very final. There is nothing that will change that, you know? Yeah. And uh, I feel for him. I really do. Uh, I really do. Yeah, it's really a crappy situation, uh, the worst situation you could ever be in. And, you know, like we talked about what's his face earlier. I'm drawing a blank. The uh, America's uh, most wanted John Walsh. John Walsh reached directly out to him to make and made a statement that we talked about earlier. Um, and hopefully she finds some kind of comfort in that and will be able to get some kind of closure. I. I mean, it's going to depend on how this trial goes. Right. But, yeah. And I, you know, honestly, hearing this information about Kaylee sitting up and being trapped and all that, I actually had a really hard time processing that initially because I was imagining it in my my non-imagining brain <laughs> where I can't see images. But for some reason, that really stuck with me. Like, and I was trying to picture what that looked like. and I, it, Sometimes, which is weird with my aphantasia where I can't see things in my head, things pop up that I can kind of see that I don't want to see, that I'm not trying to imagine. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's happening involuntary. Mm -hmm. And I ke it kept happening with this image of Kaylee, and it was really hard for me to process because it's it gave me a whole nother perspective on the scene. And it just, I don't know, it's it's hard. Like it's, I don't know it for whatever that mental image of her slumped, slumped over was hard for me to think about. Um, and especially knowing what my next topic is going to be, which is like post-mortem autopsy, determining time of death, thinking about all those processes that happen in the body. It just made it even harder, but we're going to get into that next. Um, and let me know what you guys think um about this bit of information like what does it say to you uh how does that change what you thought about the crime scene um i'm still processing it honestly 
but I would love to hear your ideas and opinions in the comments. Let us know. All right, so for story number three here, we have the insane story of Dorothy Jane Scott, the unsolved abduction and unfortunate murder. Um, and this one is crazy. I feel like there was nothing here uh, for investigate. It's really a strange one. Um, but Dorothy Jane Scott disappeared from the UC Irvine Medical Center in the early morning hours of May 28th, 1980, while attending an employee meeting. Um, so she went to a meeting that morning, right? And it sounds like there were quite a few people there and just some, well, I guess I'll wait to get into that, that backstory. Uh, but uh, there were quite a few employees there. And as they're sitting around a table, uh, her and another one of the employees look over and realize there's like this giant bump on one of their employees arms. Yeah. So uh, they say like, dude, you need to get that checked out. And, and, you know, he was complaining of pain and everything. So they take him to the, the ER, which is really nice. Uh, but they go to the ER and uh, find out that it is a black widow bite and they get a medication and everything. And they uh, they're waiting there to get the prescription and <laughs> uh, Dorothy offers to go get the car ready so that he doesn't have to walk out. He's still feeling kind of funky from it. And she was going to bring the car around to meet them. Okay. And she goes out there um, and they come out sometime later to stand at the front and wait for her. And they see the, this car flying towards them with the lights on. And it is Dorothy's car and it drives right past them and keeps going and they they had like the brights on their face and they could never see who was actually driving that car oh my well gosh. they thought at first that uh you know dorothy had a son and maybe there was some kind of an emergency so mm. uh they don't they don't say anything they find their own ride home um but once they realize they can't get a hold of her the next day um they're worried. Yeah, they they're worried, and they they file a missing persons. Um, and just some interesting backstory here. So while in between going from the meeting to uh, the the ER, Dorothy has a son, and her parents watch her son a lot of times. And she decided to stop by the house on the way there. And she changed a scarf from a red scarf to a black scarf uh, and went to the hospital from there. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so cops look for her everywhere and they can't find her anywhere, nowhere. And the father decides after a couple weeks to... Uh, put out a reward for her hmm. and uh, her father. Okay. So her, her father is Jacob Scott. And uh, like I said, he, he decides to run an ad in the local newspaper uh, with the Santa Ana, Ana register. And it was a reward for $2,500 for anyone with information regarding what happened to Dorothy. That same day, there's a call into the paper, and this person says uh, they're the ones who um, have Dorothy, and they gave some details that were not released to the public, and police believe this was the actual killer. Uh, they mentioned that um, she left to go take a coworker to the hospital. They mentioned that coworker had a black widow bite specifically. They mentioned that she had on a red scarf and changed it to a black scarf. Yeah. Super weird, that right? Is so weird. Very, 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 very strange. Um, two weeks later, or is it, or is it one week? I think it's one week later. Um, 
her family starts receiving calls every Wednesday saying, I have your daughter, and then hanging up. Or, I, I killed your daughter, and hanging up. Not asking for reward money, nothing. Not asking for nothing. Just taunting. Taunting, it. yep. Just taunting. So, uh, the police installed a, re a recorder in there to track the location. Um, and uh, what's interesting is this went on for years, literally years. Here's another interesting fact is the person on the other end would only talk if it was her mom that answered. Oh, he Jacob was there one day uh, and answered the phone and he didn't say anything and hung up and stopped calling. Is that not weird? That's super creepy. Super, super, super strange. So they start doing some background, find out some information. Uh, it appears that for a few months leading up to her disappearance, uh, Dorothy was actually receiving calls herself. Mm. Yeah. And I don't think anyone understood the entire scope of these calls, but Suspicious. looking. Suspicious. Yeah. Looking back now, she moved three times in two months. Oh, wow. Yeah. And she had a son? And she had a son. Yes. Wow. Yes, yes. So there's a couple very strange circumstances in here. And you know what's really strange is one of the times she answered, the person on the other end said that uh, that because he loved her, he was going to cut her up into tiny pieces and hide her where no one else could find her. Ugh. That's super, super creepy. Oh my gosh. How terrifying would that be? Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. It is terrifying. It's a straight up stalker. Serial killer. killer stalker. Yeah, yeah. Trying to take like full possession and power. I mean, because like Rex Huerman was calling the family members. I know. I know. It was awful. Um, so to get to the interesting parts here okay so it wasn't until four years later where everything was turned upside down so after jacob picked up the phone the calls essentially stopped all right well in on august 6 of 1984 a foreman of a construction company was preparing to dig a trench for pacific bell telephone lines when they came upon dog remains okay and they got out to look at it and then realize there are also human remains here oh gosh not a full body but enough human remains to realize it's human dog and human together yeah and there's some speculation around that but they found a head they were able to identify the dental records and confirm that it was dorothy some speculation around the dog has been that it was placed there to throw uh, dogs, scent dogs, off their trail. Oh. There's also been some speculation because it was down at the bottom of a ravine that the body was placed up at the top. And due to rain and the fire, because these were charred remains, and the reason why they were charred is a wildfire swept through there uh, a year prior and mm. chart everything you know but it it said that they came down and that's why there's missing body parts you run, know like from the flooding off, yeah. and after uh you know there's been a wildfire that loosens up dirt so that it, it just commonly will have mudslides small mudslides you know yeah well the plants all die and roots help hold in all that dirt and yep. then water comes after all those things have died and are charred and it all just slides down yeah 
Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. A little bit of background here, looking into the potential theories, because that's a very strange case. It's strange they didn't have much evidence. It's strange that this person seemingly knew so much about her. Uh, you know that when they called to when they were taunting, uh, I, I believe it was the newspaper. They said that when she was at the hospital that day, um, he found out that she was cheating on him with another guy. And he also said that she called him while she was at the hospital waiting for her coworker to be seen about the spider bite. But she wasn't there alone. She went there with another female coworker, and that female coworker confirmed that she never left her side. Therefore, no call was made. So I think whoever this killer is was making stuff up in their head, or trying to throw people off the off the path, off the 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 trail. You know. Yeah. So who could it be? There's a few theories. Somebody she worked with. It it could be. It could be. So she had a son. And this is strange. This was my first, like, was this some kind of hiring? But I don't think it was. So um, Sean was her son's name. Uh, and his father is Dennis Terry. And she was in an all-girl band. When she was younger, traveling the U.S., she met this guy in the Midwest. She ended up getting pregnant, uh, having the baby uh, away from the California area, and then moved back to the area, okay? Well, she had the son without con contest for four years. Okay. Sean, or Dennis just recently wanted to take him for the next four Four years, like you got him four years. I want to have him four years, completely ignoring the fact that changing a routine after having that routine for four years would cause issues. So they ended up getting in a, a big fight and everything. And here's the interesting part, too, is right before she went missing, he traveled from Missouri to the area. Like, he was there just days prior. Oh. Yeah, because he lived in Missouri. Oh, that's, yeah, that's odd. So strange. But police swear he is a solid alibi where her parents don't believe he did it. He was on a bus ride. There's eyewitnesses confirming he was on the bus riding back to Missouri uh, the day of her disappearance. And then... He called the parents' house looking for her the day after, and he wouldn't have been able to get there in that amount of time. Oh, okay. So, so it seems like his alibi is pretty strong. For himself, could there be another way? Could it have been a setup and a hired hit? Yeah, Or the that's person a good point that too. ended her isn't the one that's calling and doing the taunting. Did he meet the father, but not the mother? Yeah, maybe. I don't know either, but he had receipts and he had some kind of evidence and proof that it couldn't be him. Hmm. Um, now, this is an interesting one. A Mike Butler. Mike Butler was a known acquaintance of Dorothy's. He worked at an auto body shop across the street from where Dorothy worked at Swinger Psych Shop and Custom John's Head Shop. Um, and this guy was a mechanic uh, and was the, the brother of one of Dorothy's co-workers. He also came out and told police that he wanted to marry her. Dorothy? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's and that's weird. interesting because he worked right across the street from her. So would he be able to see what she's wearing every day? Would he be able to... Oh, and I forgot this one part. One day... Somebody called her work because they had been calling her work in her house for those three months prior and said, hey, I left a present for you outside. And she went to her car and it was a dead rose on her car. Oh my 
Yeah. Gosh, so many creepy things. Like, oh this whole story's creepy. It's so creepy. So, could he have been that? With such easy access, he saw her going yeah. and coming. He saw her leave. Could he have followed her and been like, where is she going? You know, and not been able to let go. It makes sense. Um, I mean, you that access when you're trying to determine a suspect is really important. It is. It's really important. Really important. This guy ended up dying in 2014. This case is being continued right now by her son. Oh, really? Because... There's no answers. He, yep. wants, he wants answers. He wants answers. Yep. Um, then there's John Kaikola. John Kaikola owned and managed the stores where Dorothy worked as a bookkeeper. Um, what's interesting is Dorothy's father sold these two stores to John Kaikola. Oh. Yeah, and there was speculation that he was interested in Dorothy. He also ended up getting in trouble for tax evasion. So people have speculated, did Dorothy find something in the books that caused him to want to end her? And put together this big old scheme Wait. before doing it? Because remember, what's interesting is whoever this was would never speak to her father. And right. Dorothy's father sold this business to him. Oh, okay. Weird. Strange, right? Because they all seem like they would have like a motive and they like all means. Seem good. And they all could have access potentially. So it seems... <laughs> Oh no, that's hard to narrow those down. I agree except for with you. I guess the son's father who has a pretty good alibi. A pretty good alibi, but could have hired someone. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. being from Missouri and being in the area literally right before the this crime happened is very suspicious. Yeah. Like very suspicious. Yep. Yeah. Very strange. It is super strange. Yeah. But I mean, I'm glad that her son is still trying to seek justice for her and figure it out because, wait, the last one, he's not alive anymore, right? He's not. Nope. Well, I mean, that's like good and bad, I guess, since it'll be harder to get justice with somebody yeah. who's passed away. But in the same respect, if he is the guy, he's not on the streets anymore. Yeah. But that's odd. Yeah. It is. It is. I just can't imagine that amount of time, like walking to get your car and like you're trying to meet your coworkers to take them to the hospital. Like that amount of time she gets taken and they literally see her driving by, but they can't tell who's driving. I know it is. It is crazy. It is absolutely crazy. And it's really sad. She looks like, you know, a pretty younger woman. Uh, clearly, I mean, multiple guys were interested in her, uh, including some crazies. This is a really sad story, but also a spooky one. When I was reading it, I was like, is this fiction? We're talking about like animal bones next to the body and. Swingers head shops and like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I thought for sure this was fan fiction or, or you know, uh, fiction, crime, whatever, crime fiction. And I looked it up and no, sure enough, it's legitimate. Never solved. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's sad. It's a, it's pretty sad. Like, you know, her son being at home, moving that many times, living in fear for months. Because this guy, whoever was calling, was terrifying. Like, that sounds like Rex Hurman. Like, I that agree. sounds like a straight up serial killer. And where is he now? You know? That's scary. Scary. So, mm -hmm. what year did this happen in? In 1980. 1980. Yeah. What if it was Rex? <laughs> it was May 28th of 1980. 
and her body was found four years later. Oh, and you want to know what else is speculated and there's no way to verify it is the land that she was found on was supposedly owned by the guy who owned the two shops that was purchased from her dad. Oh, weird. Huh. I can't find confirmation of that though. This whole story is spooky. It makes me feel like there's some weird ritual and, you know, some experts have speculated that there was an animal next to her for ritualistic purposes to like oh, connect think about her that. and her killer together or like, yeah. I didn't really think about weird. that. These Some of these older cases are pretty spooky. It just sucks that they don't have the level of evidence that we would get today. Uh, but, you know, it's just as serious. The same lives are lost, man. Yeah. But let me know true. what you guys think. This one is a spooky one. Have you heard of it before? Um, if you have and you have additional information, leave it below. Her son is still looking to this day. So uh, what suspect do you believe it is? Let me know. So this got brought up the other day in a live stream um, on the True Crime Talk show um, where we were kind of talking about time of death and how that's determined. And I can't remember exactly how it got brought up, but I decided I wanted to dive into it because that's an aspect um, of the investigation we haven't dug into and determining time of death physically, not just with like you know, phones and app data and cameras like, you know, that were nearby and because. Yeah. I think we we're talking specifically about bodies, right? And well, the we, we were talking about, I, what I think we were talking about is how the timeline of the case has changed so much. And the fact that we got this general range of time from like, I think it was like what anywhere from 2 AM to like 5 AM. And then they narrowed it down from 2 AM to 4 AM. And then it changed to like four yeah. or maybe it was like three to four and then four. Um, and then more specifically like four twenty or something, something like that. Um, I can't remember the exact time right now, but um, it, it made me question, like, especially with the rumors we have heard that it was hot in the house, that the front door was open at 8.30 a.m. Um, it makes me question the condition of the bodies and how, if they handled this crime scene right, did they take the proper steps to determine time of death at scene as soon as possible? Because if, if you, and the coroner got there super late too. So it makes me question, was there a pathologist there? Was there a medical examiner there? Was there anybody there who could determine the time of death since Mabbitt was hours late? Mm -hmm. Because that's important when like literally within 30 minutes after passing away, Things start to set in. Yeah. Things start to change, mm -hmm. and like the, liver temperature, internal temperature, uh, all rigor kinds mortis, of things. All those other mortises we've looked up with, like the blood pooling and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Which is what I wanted to d dig into a little bit. Is like, how do they determine a time of death? Yeah, that's and, good. And, and it's important because these things they get to a point if it's gone too long, it gets harder and harder and harder to estimate that time of death and the conditions of the scene can make it harder to determine that death. Now we don't have to worry about water or anything like that. Cause water is one thing that makes it much, much harder fire. It's one well, that makes it much, much moisture harder in the air. Yeah. Moisture in there. Sure. Yeah. So some of the things they use to estimate time of death um, is body temperature, rigor mortis, liver mortis, degree of putrefaction, stomach contents, corneal cloudiness. So that's the eyes, um, oh. vitreous potassium levels, insect ac activity, which is entomology and scene markers. 
Okay. What That's are, just some of the things. What's a scene marker? Uh, I'm assuming things around the scene. Oh, okay. Like okay. things like gathered through the investigation. Like a phone that was yeah. last touched at, you know what yeah. I mean? Okay, got it. Yep. So I I specifically started looking at like the stages, the ones you know? that could apply essentially. Y- yeah. yeah, and and there are. So let me let me say there is a deeper dive into this with some new technologies um, that I found, but I can't quite comprehend them yet. Like that's something I'm going to have to really go into and look really deep into because all I can find is like studies, like actual papers written on it by scientists. And that's hard to understand. It's not written in layman terms. It's written from a perspective of a scientist, like a doctor who understands all of that kind of language that has to do with medical terminology and, you know, sciencey tech like terminology. And it's hard to understand. Um, but I did find other things other than what I just listed, which basically the body temperature, especially I think in this kind of situation we're talking about here, which is, Within, say, the crimes happen between three to four, they get there at noon. That gives them what, like eight hours, mm-hmm. not and maybe nine if they need everybody to get there within an hour to uh, so like about eight to ten hours, and that is about the time where that might start not being accurate anymore. Uh. Okay. So it's that's concerning, but that's like that those kinds of things need to be done as soon as possible, especially body temperature. Because here's one thing I didn't know. Um, if the body starts cooling mm-hmm. and say it is hot, like you said it was in there, because the body's getting cooler, it's gonna start taking on the temperature of the room. And if it's hot in there, you have such a little margin. Yeah, but that could also... uh, Say it's 80 degrees in there. Yeah. And the body's temperature is 98.5. That The body temperature decreases by 1.5 degrees per hour. Okay. 1.5 per hour. I don't know what that comes to, but that doesn't sound like they have much more than... That doesn't sound like they have 10 hours. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I I mean, yes. Uh, And and when you said that the body would start taking on like the temperature of the room or whatever, that's still a giant gap. Like even if it was 80 in there, 80 is considered really hot. You know, you see a ton of steam coming out of the house. Like I I theorized with that... uh, with that news, whatever broadcast that that I found that I still need to find, um, but there's still a huge like 18 degree gap there. Yeah, and but you also have to determine the fact that okay, so apparently bodies that have more fat um, and or more clothes right lose temperature more slowly now. Th- Thinner people and people wearing less clothes are going to lose it faster. And these were thin, young women. They were. um, And they were in bed, which the bed may help insulate the body a little. But um, how much clothes were they wearing? They were going to bed. Like, did they, were they bundled up? Were they in a t shirt? Well, if they were as damaged as we believe they were wouldn't that change things it could and also blood it could coming out not staying in it could also make the body cool down faster man and and so if it's colder inside let's say they kept their house at like 55 right Mm -hmm. then wouldn't they cool quicker If they kept it at what? Like 55. 
Oh, yeah. So, like, the actual temperature of the environment matters a lot okay. with that, too. Gosh, so many factors. There but are a ton if, of factors. I wonder if they have a rough computer program, right? Because we have AI and things like that. Could you take the body? Could you just take the internal temperature, the temperature of the liver, uh, and then punch in their body fat percentage, their weight, their height, uh, their general measurements, and then could that spit out an, an estimated average? You know what I mean? So, so what I did find is there's something called Hessings, Hensigs, Hensigs nonogram and it is considered the most accurate method of measuring the time of death by means of temperature measurement um so it's basically they determine the time of death using temperature um it also mentions the glaster equation which i don't know what that is um but it sounds like they do similar things uh it's just yeah you can look it up real quick um, but it takes into consideration other factors and it's like kind of computing that. So what it takes into account is the body temperature, which they take rectally at the time. It should be as soon as possible. The ambient temperature, the body weight, the clothing, where the body was in air or water. And then there are these graphs where they chart it out. Oh, and this wow. is considered okay. the most accurate way to determine a time oh. of death using body temperature. Okay, that's interesting. And body temperature is considered the most accurate way, if the conditions are right, to determine a time of death. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. And it's in that window of time where I don't know if they could have just used body temperature. It would really depend on the environment of the scene of how hot it was in there. Yeah, or I cold. think that could change things or an unreliable temperature, too, because you got to remember part of my issue with the investigation at first is the fact that they got there. And opened up all the doors and windows. Yeah, you're right. So now you're going to have like really hot, maybe too cold to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You're, you're drastically changing these things. That's why I've said from the very beginning, there's no way it's not best to lock to everything down and turn off the heater. Just like turn off all central AC and heat and close everything. Right, right. Um, but also what's important to mention is that there's a different times of death. And I, I think that's important. So there's a physiological time of death, which is when your body shuts down. And then there's a legal time of death, which is like when the coroner shows up and says, this person is dead and puts it on your sure. death certificate. And then there's the estimated time of death which is all the clues they find throughout an investigation to determine a time of death. Mm, but okay. you never really get a physiological time of death unless you are in a perfect circumstance where you have a doctor there and they're watching the person die. That's the only way you can get like a perfect physiological death. Anything other than that is an estimated time of death. And that is calculated and estimated. It's, a very, it, from everything I've seen, it's a pretty rough estimate. And I, I saw somebody argue before a, a while back that they, they can get it down to 30 minutes. Like they absolutely know what time this crime happened based off of the bodies and the autopsies. I don't agree. I think they could well. maybe get it down to an hour. Oh, okay. I was going to say, I think there's some like cellular technology where they look really small there, down at the cells and that gives them a better understanding. I did find some stuff like that, but like I said, that's the stuff that's super hard to understand. Sure. That's going to have to be dug into more because I found a paper that started diving into stuff like that, but dude. Cellular degeneration so, or whatever. So here's one, biochemical assessment. 
The biochemical blood assessment is non-significant in the immediate postmortem phase due to the lack of cellular death. On the other hand, cellular death makes biochemical blood assessment in the early phase extremely difficult. Also, there is redistribute, redistribute, redistrib. I can't talk. Redistribute, redistribution. Jeez, um, of electrolytes from the cells into the plasma and serum, resulting in varying changes in the levels of these electrolytes. These variations and their implications are studied in the emerging in the emerging field of than thanat. Thanato, thanato, mm-hmm. thanato chemistry. The biochemical assessment has been useful for estimating PMI, which is basically time of death, from vitreous humor synovial fluid. Okay. Uh, pericardial fluid, urine, cerebrospinal fluid. Numerous factors, however, need to be accounted for when examining uh, the time of death death based on biochemistry including but not limited to age gender so basically all those things cause of death other intrinsic and extrinsic factors only a few biochemical markers out of 388 were found to have had sufficient investigation with these considerations namely potassium sodium urea as well as chloride magnesium hypoxithine and cardiac tri- triopenin t so basically they could look at these like electrolytes and things um, and they're considered biochemical markers uh, being judged to have had suitable research for use. Six were found to be suitably researched but not suitable for practical use. 18 were found to have been poorly investigated and not suitable for application. Like it's super complicated. Yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds like it. And then there's various other like supra vital reactions, um, aerobic respiration. I it's wish like, there was a way to get it down though, because like, dude, you're dead once your heart stops. There's also right? a molecular so. assessment that has to do with DNA. Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. But this one again is this is this one was even harder for me to understand. Um. The analysis showed RNA degeneration was time dependent for the entire 11 hours. Although no statistical statistical significance was demonstrable for the first four hours. Uh, researchers selected 11 genes for quantitative PCR analysis while RNA in the heart was found to be the most stable. It showed no correlation with PMI. Six genes were found to correlate with the time of death. Four in the femoral quadriceps and two genes in the liver. So, and then they made mathematical models to use this to like hmm. determine, I guess, the time of death. An error means a 51.4 minutes. So, I'm guessing that's the range they can determine it in is 51.4 minutes in that particular study. So, essentially, an hour. Yeah. And they, it's talking about proteins like that. I'm just mentioning that to let you know it's there, but I don't understand it. And I'm sure you didn't understand much of it. So that's why I went back to the basics so I can understand that to be able to understand the more complicated things, which I may be able to do a part two on because those are interesting because they seem like if they would work, if you could look at cells and determine, if that, I don't know why that makes me feel like that could potentially be more accurate, but maybe it's not. I I mean, I don't yeah, know. I, I, yeah, I guess it just depends on how quickly things start deteriorating. Oh, and they start quick because yeah. literally cells in your body start to burst. Okay. Well, like I it's feel like crazy. You should be able to take like a rough estimated drop of blood and see cells bursting and stuff. So one, a few things I found interesting. I did go into the mortises, like rigor mortis, liver mortis, algor mortis, um, and how they're used to determine a time of death, and they're they're interesting. So. One that I found really, really interesting, especially after looking at 
that interview from the Gonzalez family is that Haley was supposedly sitting up, trapped up against the wall, right? Yeah. Well, liver mortis is when you have pooling of the blood in certain areas, right? Yeah. So everything stops. Your heart's not pumping. So blood starts to pull to wherever the most gravity is. Yep. And then as it pools, if you're laying on something in those lower points, like say, like I saw a picture of a lady who died on a park bench and she was laying on her back. Well, she had the complete pattern in her back and those are pressure points. Well, say somebody came and moved her and laid her face down on the ground. They could see, okay, well, she was laying on that park bench because all the lividity is in her back and she has that pattern. Mm -hmm. That starts setting in like within 30 minutes. Wow. Like, and it looks like bruising. So it be, I know that, okay, so from what I saw, it, they say it starts in two hours, but I literally just listened to a coroner say it can happen in 30 minutes. It can start beginning then. So a lot of it is in a perfect world. Like this is how it typically happens. But again, there's things that can speed this up or slow it down. Yeah, um, in like a controlled situation. This is the perfect world situation. But yeah. Yeah. So you. it typically begins in two hours and is permanent in eight hours. Okay. So by the time the dispatch gets there, it's permanent. Jeez. So, but they could also see, like, they could also see if she was probably moved. Oh, yeah. I think so. We, we've talked about that before already. Because remember, like, one of the theories that was out there for a while is that underground fight club situation mm -hmm. thing and the fact that they would be able to see the liver mortis details uh if somebody was moved because it would be pooling on however they were being carried like they yeah. would see that you they could, could see that and hotter temperatures make it happen faster and colder temperatures make it happen slower interesting yeah which is because how it works colder with all temperatures of ruin evidence in a crime scene quicker cold yeah mm -hmm. yeah but From hot everything i read hot. so hot ruins the body quicker and cold ruins evidence in the crime scene quicker like what like fingerprints like uh dna evidence like anything that could tie a suspect to a crime scene Oh, interesting. Yep. I didn't know that about the DNA. But then there's rigor mortis, of course, which is the stiffness. Um, it's temporary. Uh, and it starts also about two hours in, but again, is affected by hot or cold temperatures. So I have a chart here. No visible signs of rigor mortis means less than two hours or more than 36 hours. So if you come across a body and it's there's no rigor mortis, that means they've been dead less than two or more than 36. It begins in the head and the neck, and then that's over two hours, okay? when it's supposed to be beginning and then it's everywhere with it. So 12 hours is when it's everywhere and the body is as rigorous as it could be 13 to 24 hours. It starts disappearing. Mm -hmm. Um, it's in the legs, but not in the head and neck anymore between 24 to 26 hours. Stiffness disappears 24 to 36 hours. So that eight hour time gap would make it, still progressing like it's it's still increasing okay and then there's algor mortis which is what they call the most accurate estimated 
way to estimate a uh, time of death, which is temperature. It's the loss of the temperature, which we just went over pretty yeah. extensively. So what I found interesting was all of that being used to calculate. Like, so while all of these don't seem that accurate, it seems that all of them put together could narrow you down more and more. But you know what's even more interesting? What? They can use stomach contents to determine time of death. And how, like, because, you know, there's a certain amount of time it takes to empty from your stomach. Yeah. They ate. Someone was just leaving a comment talking about that. They got food yeah. at the food truck. They were out drinking that night. They went home and ate their food. And we know about, that's what it's determined on. We need to know what time they ate the food to be able to determine time of death using the food in their oh, body. Oh, yeah. So I think knowing, it was Greg. knowing they got food and went home and ate it narrows that down a lot. Their stomachs, if okay, so it was what time when they were at the food truck? Uh, it was, I don't remember off the top of my head. They were all back home by one forty-five. Uh, yeah, you're right. So or one fifty-five. Yeah. So let's say they ate food at two o'clock yeah. and were murdered at four. Then I believe either it should be their stomach should be almost empty. Doesn't it take like three hours? I'm pretty sure it was like three hours for it to empty into the large colon. Okay. Right? Yeah, but I I would think they would be able to track it down even more than that. No. Uh like to minutes. I well, I don't know about minutes. After a meal, it normally takes one and a half hours to two hours for food to move out of the stomach into the small intestine. Interesting. So that gives them so one and a half to two hours. It is interesting. So that's 30 minutes. One and a half to two hours should be able to give them a breakdown to 30 minutes if it's in that area. Or if it's not, is there still a way to determine based on how close it would be to get getting dumped into or the large if, intestine? Or, you know, if, if it was still in their stomach, that would mean it most likely happened at three, not four. If it's at four, then it should be further down in the intestines. Yeah. Because this has to vary quite a bit because, like, it's saying it's all the way in the small intestine. That means you should be, like, going to the bathroom every, like, three to four hours, you know, after eating. And that's not realistic. Most people don't do that. I don't know. I'm just thinking about that. It's kind of weird. But that's what it says. Hmm. But I was just thinking, like, I saw the food contents used in the John Bonet Ram Ramsey case. She yeah. still had pineapple in her stomach or fruit and veg mix. It's not, they didn't actually say pineapple. Um, they said, like, it was a mixture of some kind of fruit and veg thing. Because uh, everybody kept saying pineapple. But I read the thing and it said fruit, veg mix. It didn't just say pineapple. Hmm. Interesting. But it, it makes me curious because that is a, something we actually have, like that they should have, that they should take into account is that they just ate yep. and so went if to they bed. Could, like identify when it was paid for, then you could rough estimate the time of eating, right? Whether they brought it back with them or ate on site, that could help determine it down they to They didn't a eat minute. on site. I was just meaning in general, mm -hmm. like it, that could determine it down to minutes, right? Um, then you just take that and, and track it through the stomach. Yeah, that's interesting. That is very interesting. It is. But we've been talking about these issues in the timeline. Like I'm, that's, I'm curious if that's something like, I just, I want to see the autopsy report. Yeah, I, I want to know that stuff. I want to know if they looked for that stuff um, because 
that would help determine if it happened closer to this time or that time. Now, again, it's all estimations. It is. Um, I'm going to look more into like the cellular level stuff and the DNA stuff to see if there's anything there from those studies. They didn't really sell it to me. Like what I read to you guys, it kind of sounded like they weren't sure if it worked. <laughs> really? I, didn't you get that impression? Uh, I don't know. I'm going to look more into it because Sci I'm really curious about never it. Concrete. That's one thing that we've been able to find out through all of these videos we've done is no science is concrete. Nothing. It doesn't exist. That's true. Nothing in the world is I mean, concrete. That's it's true. It's always changing. Yeah. So like, okay, it's not concrete, but like how accurate have you seen it be before? And how many times do you get accurate results like that versus how many times is it like, dude, this can't be this but do is you, way off. Do you want to know what I'm concerned about? What? Is the fact that because these calculations that they use to determine time of death are so, they can vary so much based off of random things in the environment. And they take into account what the investigators are finding on the scene to help make those determinations and narrow things down. They don't just use the physical objective evidence. They look at scene markers. They look at what's going on in the scene. Like uh -huh. if they have cell phone evidence of Xana being on TikTok, TikTok at four, if they have a video of audio of distorted audio where it sounds like a crime could possibly be happening and they have the investigators in there with them doing the autopsy and determining the time of death. Yeah, that shouldn't happen. It could be man. influenced. Yeah, but they say it's vital. Coroners, medical examiners, pathologists, they all say it's vital in determining these things. Yeah, and I say that it should be objective. Like in a in a case, case in a science case, this scientist should come up with their number. This scientist separately should come up with their number. You know, the police should do the investigation to come up with their number. And then you just compare notes and like, okay, this one probably is the most likely. So we'll go you with know what I think? for the official number. What I think should happen is you should have somebody doing an autopsy who is doing it completely blind, doesn't know who the person is, doesn't know what happened to them and is only finding the objective findings. And they are done then. They write their report, they're done. Then you have another person come in who examines what they did and they also take into account the investigator's information and give their estimate. And then you can have it checked again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. Like, I think that separating the blind, those two. Science, testing, comparison, yes. And then have someone separate compare it to the actual investigation and yep. what was at the crime scene. Yep. I agree. I agree. But I don't know. I'm not a coroner. I am not a professional at that. That's just my idea. Um, but I want to know what you guys think, if you learned anything. Um, if it was boring, I don't know. <laughs> Should I not dig deeper into the time of death? Should I? Um, I'm, I'm super curious about those sciences, so I'll probably do it on my own time anyway. But if you guys want to hear about it, definitely let me know. Um, and let me know what you think about what we learned here. And if you have anything to add to this, if you know anything about how time of death is determined that's maybe more advanced or another thing from the scene you can recall that you think could be added into this to help determine the time of death. Um, I would be really curious and thankful to hear those opinions and ideas. And that's it. Yes. All right, you guys. And that is it for the show. It is. Yeah. I could just go on forever. Yeah. Make sure you guys do all the podcast things. Hit 
all the podcast buttons all at once. Just randomly click buttons and make sure you hit the thumbs up kind and the five star kind and, you know, leave a good comment and all the things. And we appreciate all of you. Make sure you check out the podcast and the true crime talk show on every podcast platform that is out there. And what time do we do do the true crime talk show? We do do the True Crime Talk Show um, Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday every single week, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., maybe sometimes a little later, um, Central Standard Time. Uh, it's live on YouTube and Twitch, and then it gets uploaded to the podcast platforms after that, after um, it's not live anymore. So definitely come join us if you want to join in with the live chat um and yeah watch us live as we're working through these things digging deeper and just talking ideas you know yes absolutely so make sure you come check us out and everybody have a good night and we will or see day you next time bye